uh, our guests from budget, budget and tax, our speakers and the public. We are being streamed. Um, and um, the topic today is state parks and the special commission that's been working on that. Uh, from BNT, I see the chairman, uh, Chairman Gazzoni. Uh, welcome. I see uh, Senator Elfrith, and I believe we'll also be joined by one other member. Oh, there he is, uh, Senator McRae. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. That's great. Um, and thank you, committee and those out in the audience. Um, we have the pleasure uh, of being joined by the form, former governor of this great state, uh, also the former county executive of Prince George's County and a longtime friend of mine. So um, let's start with uh, Governor Glenn Denning. Uh, welcome, Paris. Thank you, Senator. Um, I also uh, left one credential out there, and that is I had a good pleasure to be uh, one of your constituents for several years, uh, which we also appreciate. So let me uh, start by thanking the presiding officers for the foresight to convene the State Park Investment Commission uh, to address the capacity shutdowns and access equity concerns that are in our state parks. Uh, special thanks uh, to you, Senator Pinsky, and the rest of the members of the Senate uh, Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee uh, for your leadership on environmental policy in Maryland and the opportunity to present uh, the very important work of this commission. I also want to thank my now uh, by Senator, uh, Senator Sarah Elfers, uh, for your guidance and uh, wisdom as a commission co-chair, along with the able co-chair uh, work that we received from a delegate uh, Lutke. Uh, and also, uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago, thank you, uh, Senator Patterson, uh, for your help and your insight on matters of inclusion uh, and diversity uh, in our state park leadership and the next generation of leaders. Yeah. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic highlighted the importance of our state park system for the health and the well-being of our citizens. Uh, because of the pandemic and demographic changes that are ongoing in our state, uh, the state park system experienced a substantial visitation increase that forced state capa park capacity shutdowns and exposed equity of access concerns. In light of these issues, uh, we heard from a variety of stakeholder groups over six meetings this past fall, uh, including uh, local, state, and federal government representatives, uh, members of the equity community, environment, and allied uh, stakeholders, as well as a national panel of experts. Uh, the commission made 40 recommendations, uh, which are divided into six categories, capacity, maintenance, staffing, funding, equity, and climate change. These recommendations are designed to improve the ability of our parks to address uh, the conservation and recreation needs of all Marylanders, uh, to eliminate the critical maintenance pro uh, a project backlog in three years, uh, to increase park staff diversity and add 100 positions in two years, uh, to restructure the transfer tax repayment to provide immediate funding for critical park needs, and to enable greater access to our parks for seniors and Marylanders with disabilities. And lastly, to support the state's ongoing climate change, mitigation and adaptation activities, uh, a policy issue that I know uh, is dear to uh, both of our hearts, uh, Chairman Pinsky. Uh, permit me to take just a moment to make specific reference uh, to recommendation 40, uh, the equity reforestation program. This is of uh, personal interest to me, given the combination of human health improvements and the climate change uh, mitigation that it embodies and addresses very uh, forcefully the equity issue. Uh, the proposal for the program works in parallel with the rest of the commission's recommendations to improve access to Maryland state parks by bringing parks or at least park-like environments uh, to all people in our state uh, the program would proactively reforest historically underserved areas in partnerships with local governments, communities, and individual homeowners in order to promote human health and to mitigate climate change in collaboration with the efforts supported by the Tree Solutions Now Act of 2021 and any other tree planting programs in the state. Uh, Senators Pinsky and Patterson, uh, you and I, 
uh, see regularly uh, the impact of this disparity uh, between uh, different communities in Prince George's County. Um, the commission made its recommendation in the context uh, of the historic funding surpluses that uh, allow for a once in a generation opportunity to ensure that our state park system is positioned not only as a national leader, but also as a model for linking park considerations with climate change, equity, and human health. I thank you all for having us here today uh, and for uh, permitting uh, this work uh, to be presented. Let me at this time uh, turn to Senator Elford uh, for her uh, comments on the commission's work. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members of the committee, I'll, I'll be brief. I just wanna amplify what the governor mentioned. This is a real opportunity. I know all of us and our constituents rediscovered our state parks during the pandemic to the extent that we saw a 45% increase in visitorship. We also saw significant shutdowns because of occupancy challenges. And we saw the result of, of decades of underinvestment in our state parks. Uh, my, our our co-chair delegate Lukey puts it best that, you know, we really began this investment in preservation and opening up state parks in the early part of the 20th century, we saw the next great iteration of parks investment in the 60s and 70s. And, and I believe now is the time for the, the third great era of state parks investment that this report and the subsequent bill will usher in, all with an eye and a lens towards access, equity, and investment in communities that do not have the same access to green spaces as every other Marylander. So um, we're going to hear from the wonderful staff who did the all the work here. And I want to thank them for the, the late nights and weekends they put into not just the report, but in subsequently translating that report into legislation. And Mr. Chair, if it's appropriate, a shameless plug for that legislation, uh, to welcome co-sponsors uh, for it. We plan to be introducing it on Thursday and uh, we will be sending out an email to everyone's offices uh, as soon as this hearing concludes. That is a shameless plug, uh, <laughs> uh, colleague, uh, but thank you. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Baker, Mr. Gray, do you have presentations or you back up or are you going to walk through the recommendations? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, okay. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Governor Glennie and Senator Elfrith. Um, good afternoon, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committee. Uh, Jeremy Baker and Andrew Gray from DLS. Uh, the Senate President and the Speaker of the House established the Commission to investigate and make recommendations regarding overcrowding and capacity closures in state parks. More specifically, the Commission reviewed whether existing state park facilities are able to meet the demand for outdoor recreation, particularly in light of rapidly increasing park visitation and outdoor recreation rates due to the pandemic, whether current funding and staffing levels are sufficient to provide a high quality park experience, the need for new state park offerings and whether there are any recreational deserts in the state and whether the park system adequately provides recreational opportunities to all Marylanders, including vulnerable populations. Next slide. During the interim, the commission held several meetings between September and November. And as Governor Glendening mentioned, heard testimony from a variety of groups and panels. The commission also received written testimony from a wide array of stakeholders, including current and former government officials, nonprofit organizations, friends of parks groups, and individual residents. Ultimately, the commission voted to approve 40 recommendations in total. The recommendations generally fall into six categories, capacity, maintenance, staffing, funding, equity, and climate change. The, the presentation materials that you all have include all 40 recommendations for you to review. Andrew and I intend to focus on the issues and deliberations that were central to the commission's work, but we are happy to answer questions related to any of the recommendations. Overarching issues that the commission addressed, uh, the first would be the order of the recommendations. The recommendations uh, and categories are generally ordered relative to the need to address capacity shutdowns from the most short-term and small scale to the most long-term and large scale. And again, those are capacity, maintenance, staffing, funding, equity, and climate change. Uh, the second one is carrying capacity. The carrying capacity issue in state parks, meaning the amount and type of recreation use that is compatible with the management prescription for an area, is critical to understanding these capacity shutdowns, but was never fully understood or addressed by the commission. Ongoing issues are temporary pandemic related issues. Uh, there is an increasing capacity shutdown trend, which was exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
DNR cooperation and testimony, uh, the department either testified that the, there were no problems or that the problems raised by the commission are already being addressed by the department. Uh, funding availability, uh, there is substantial state fund balance and the possibility of federal funding, but it is unclear how much of either will be available for the needs identified by the commission. And finally, the scope of the commission. It is not clear whether the commission was intended to be a one-time effort or uh, to lead to a more ongoing process and whether the commission should make incremental or transformative recommendations related to the park system. The graphic you see on your screen shows the increasing numbers of visitors to state parks between 2010 and 2020 and the corresponding increase in capacity closures. Between 10, 2010 and 2020, park visitation almost doubled. 2021 is not shown on this particular graphic, but saw 21.5 visitors to the state parks. Between 2010 and 2020, capacity closures also increased in general. With the onset of the pandemic, closures peaked in 2020 with 292 in total. It is clear that visitation will continue to increase and capacity closures will persist without significant investment in park system capacity. However, the exact severity of the problem and its relationship to the pandemic is harder to measure. Getting into our recommendations, the first category is capacity and increasing recreational opportunities. Uh, transparency versus administrative autonomy. This is related to recommendations one and three. The commission identified the need for an overarching comprehensive long range strategic plan, as well as a capital oriented facilities master plan to be, to be reviewed every five years. And this is in recognition of the need for ongoing oversight of the park system and the implementations of any legislation that may pass this year. Uh, the second one is park size and amenities. This is recommendations one, four, and five. The commission considered capacity, capacity issues in terms of expanding activities on existing state lands, redesignating existing state lands as state parks, and adding new state parks while balancing the need for conservation and recreation goals at each particular property. Finally, we have Baltimore City New Park versus Cooperative Park, uh, recommendation number six. The commission heard from Baltimore City about its work and needs to uh, and needs and determine that cooperation with Baltimore City on existing parks, such as Gwynn Falls and Leakin Park, is preferable to creating a new state park within Baltimore City. Continuing with capacity, there is the issue of private land access versus public land access. This is recommendation seven. The U.S. National Park Service presented on the greater proportion of conserved private land in Maryland relative to other states, such as Pennsylvania, which led the commission to consider the need to address access to private land while keeping private property rights in mind. State versus other, including local and federal focus, recommendations eight, nine, and 10. Uh, this was the need to coordinate efforts with local governments and the federal government, uh, including trail connectivity, whole systems park planning, and the use of digital messaging and reservations across different park systems. Outsourcing versus keeping in-house, recommendation number 11. The commission noted the interest in expanding opportunities for concessionaires as opposed to true outsourcing or privatization, giving up physical assets or control over the management process. The commission considered this in the, concept, in the context of DNR's new Office of Outdoor Recreation. And finally, historic preservation, recommendation number two. The commission identified the need to survey, document, and make plans for opportunities for historic preservation in both new and existing state parks particularly to tell and preserve the stories of Black Marylanders and other underrepresented communities. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Andrew Gray. Thank you, Jeremy. So for the maintenance slide here, what you're seeing is the critical maintenance program funding over the years. What I'd just like to highlight is that the ending balance for the critical maintenance program, the amount of funding that's actually still available at the end of the year keeps climbing. So there are capacity issues in terms of getting that money out the door. What's not shown here is the fact that there's a critical maintenance backlog that also appears to be increasing. It's been reported recent years around $60 million, but could be closer to 80 even or $100 million, depending on how one looks at that uh, capacity uh, backlog in terms of what types of projects are included. In terms of the maintenance category of recommendations, recommendations number 12 through 17, kind of look at the capital development program capacity, as you just noted in the transparency issues there, kind of um, whether that should be a deference to the agency or whether there really needs to be a, really digging into the issue of are there enough people within DNR's engineering and construction program to be able to both fix the parks with a critical maintenance program and then also provide for new amenities with the Natural Resources Development Fund. The transparency aspect there is kind of really looking at that issue of asset management and trying to understand what does the park system have in terms of assets right now? What is their status? 
and what needs to be done to make sure that they're at the status level we want them to be in order to provide for the Marylanders. Procurement authorities, recommendation number 18, so, uh, pertains to the idea that uh, the Department of Natural Resources uh, recently only had procurement authority up to $50,000 for projects. So with inflation over the years, that really reduced project size uh, significantly in terms of what they're able to handle in-house. They say they've increased the capacity up to $100,000. They've been approved through the Department of General Services, but there seems to be a need to kind of make sure that's really clear for everybody to understand that. In terms of kind of looking at the cost index as a construction cost index, this is really a concern for the entire state. And so this is obviously a concern also for the Department of Natural Resources to be able to kind of understand what those cost changes look like over time and is DNR's ability to procure for those projects, keeping up with those cost inflation uh, factors. In terms of outsourcing and capital development versus keeping in-house, um, this is a recommendation uh, reflected there, whether outside entities such as the Maryland Stadium Authority should step in, should be um, provided resources to do some of this work is a question that the commission kind of wrestled with. Uh, one of the ideas there, if the stadium authority were to be asked to do additional work, that they would need to be compensated with positions to do that work. In terms of increasing staffing versus improving the quality of staffing, the commission kind of wrestled with this idea, recommendation number 20. A lot of input from the Maryland Rangers Association really guided the commission in terms of its uh, recommendations. And that recommendation was to increase staffing by 100 positions over the next two fiscal years. This raised some questions about funding, um, and some internal discussions within the commission about whether this kind of imposed additional requirements on the administration. So that was definitely a concern. We've kind of tentatively identified that it could mean around $10 million or so once that full funding level for the positions is, it, um, uh, is it provided. In terms of the management review and um, kind of its staffing, recommendations 21 through 27 really apply to the relationship between Department of Natural Resources and the Maryland Park Service. And then also the uh, kind of larger relationship with the Department of Budget and Management in terms of recruitment and tension for uh, positions. So some of the concerns that the agency or the uh, commission, excuse me, were addressing were speed of hiring, diversity of the people that are hired, salaries, salary levels, whether they're appropriate level uh, to hire the people we want to hire for the state, and also the kind of looking at historic trades, and also the question of volunteer management, realizing that the state's not going to be able to do everything, leveraging the volunteer resources from the private sector, from the general community is also important. And working on the National Park Service, we looked at some of the models that they had kind of, kind of come up with for that purpose. In terms of law enforcement, recommendations 28 and 29 address those concerns that the uh, Maryland Park Service, or Park Service Associates really are working as first responders, but are not identified as such. And so there are real concerns that they needed to be identified as uh, first responders. The commission then also did think about and look at the idea of whether there should be a consideration for perhaps having park rangers return to the having law enforcement powers, but realize that this is beyond the scope of the commission's work. This was something that would actually turn back the clock back to 2003, four and five time period when park rangers did have law enforcement powers, but then they were moved out uh, to the natural resources police for uh, cost saving considerations, which then leads to this kind of final component of the discussion was law enforcement availability in the parks. Even if law enforcement uh, powers are not granted to the park rangers, there's the question of whether the park rangers and their uh, managers at each uh, park would have the ability to be able to, to tell the natural resources police they need more um, oversight in their particular parks. And that was something that the, the uh, commission thought about, but did not dig into in terms of actually creating a recommendation on that particular score. In terms of the transfer taxes, recommendation number 30, this is really the kind of primary funding source that the commission kind of thought about because this is the major funding source going into the Maryland Park Service. You have the Forest and Park Reserve Fund for all the fees for coming in the parks, but really, the Park Service has um, generated a substantial amount of revenue from the transfer tax. Therefore, the idea was if there's a repayment, which there is, $174.3 million or so over the next um, number of years through 20, fiscal 2031, uh, excuse me, then why not forward fund that transfer tax repayment in order to be able to provide for immediate relief in the Maryland Parks, provide for the needs of the commission identified? The, um, another consideration here is that if you're going to put in a, a forward funding for capital purposes, that works. Obviously, you can do a lot of critical maintenance work with that money kind of brought forward, but you can't use that money for ongoing operating expenses, such as, for instance, the 100 new positions that would be added. 
Therefore, a sustainable funding source is definitely a consideration that the uh, commission thought about, but did not kind of go explore explicitly as something that could be addressed in a future change to the transfer tax formula, for instance, to provide for more money, operating money for the Department of Natural Resources. In terms of a statutory funding goal, a consideration was that there should be some kind of funding level for the Maryland Park Service, but that was um, discarded and the idea was more to focus on the capacity and the functionality of the park system, making sure that with, even with increasing visitation levels, that the park was able to provide for, park service was able to provide for improved equity of access and uh, mitigate climate change. So there's really more the functional relationship between uh, kind of funding and the park system as opposed to just a pure funding number, which would that not have any kind of substantive backing to it. In terms of equity concerns, the Maryland Park Equity Mapper is a very important tool that's being explored. This looks at a lot of the kind of underserved um, areas in our state in terms of uh, people, uh, lower economic uh, situations or just lack of parks, and then trying to kind of gauge where those parks should be brought to the people. So that was something that's a park equity mapper tool the um, University of Maryland and Martin Natural Resources are using that will inform a lot of the activities kind of going forward for park equity access. In terms of some of the access or equity um, considerations, recommendations 34 through 36 involved uh, transportation, Maryland Department of Transportation and kind of getting access to state parks. They did note in their um, response to the recommendations from draft recommendations that any funding to go towards increasing access to our state parks would potentially take away from other transportation projects. That provides a little bit of a challenge in terms of how to make sure that there's some synergy instead of a trade-off in terms of the work that they would be doing. And then in terms of universal design standards, there's a question here about whether the Department of Natural Resources is going far enough to make sure our seniors and people, Marylanders with disabilities are served for, by our Maryland park system. Um, and in terms of the last slide here, uh, Land and Waters goal here is um, the 30 by 30 goal to preserve 30% of uh, Maryland's land and waters by 2030. So the recommendation by the commission was to include land and waters, but really the intent of the commission, unfortunately, I believe this was a staff error on my part, that we did not take out the waters component of that recommendation. And really the, the focus is on land only, based on my understanding that there's kind of a, a there's been agreements about a, 20, a 30 by 30 goal that would just be for land in Maryland. And then finally there, in terms of bringing people to the parks versus bringing parks to the people, I think uh, the chair eloquently talked about the uh, equity restoration reforestation program, excuse me, and the kind of recommendation 40 and what that would do. And that's kind of your biggest picture look at kind of what the, um, the park commission was looking at and it would work in synergy with the Tree Solutions Now Act of 2021. That's already, well, we, we're now available for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gray and Mr. Baker. Um, first, in terms of the last slide and what uh, Governor Glenn spoke about, uh, this committee and, and this legislature obviously took a strong stand last year in committing to uh, plant 5 million trees over the next 10 years and 10% 10, and 10 of those in urban underserved areas. Uh, which gets to the point uh, Governor Glenn spoke about earlier in terms of Baltimore, Prince George's, and other areas across the state uh, that have no tree cover or not as enough tree cover. And uh, we also know that it actually serves as a twofer, if you would. It also cleans up the bay. If they're planted appropriately in buffer areas, they can absorb runoff uh, before they go into our streams, rivers. So besides absorbing carbon dioxide and, and this committee, and the legislature in Toto took strong stand last year to start in this direction. With that, um, we're going to take questions. I, I may uh, lean towards uh, budget and tax because I know they have some hearings and have to get back to their hearings. So let's start with uh, Senator McRae. Senator McRae, please, welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um, Chair, and thank you all for the presentation. Just one quick question. Recommendation number six, uh, DNR and the city of Baltimore should collaborate on improvements for Wins Falls Park, Lincoln Park, just wanted to understand during the conversation of the hearings, uh, was it talked about whether this would be new money or existing funding? I see that on page 20, POS is recommend uh, is talked about with the six million, but it wasn't, I wasn't clear on whether this is new money or existing money. And I'm talking about new money for the capital investment, the future maintenance, and just the programmatic stuff. You all can elaborate on what did that conversation sound like and what did it sound like with DNR? I know I'm very familiar with what my city uh, needs, but what did DNR say on this presentation? 
It's, uh, in terms of that original conversation, it was a conversation brokered by uh, Delegate Boyce with the city. And they definitely presented a lot of their capital needs and the amazing work that they're doing in the city. And I think the conversation sort of ended in terms of the commission's work with the idea that additional collaboration should occur there. And my understanding is that there has been some movement by the administration to explore that as well. But my understanding was that there wasn't any kind of firm dollar figure put into the commission's recommendations. The idea was moving forward, there should be a stronger collaboration. If I could add to that, um, it's just sort of part of the whole system park approach, um, just sort of getting access, whether it's a state park, a local park, a national park, just sort of providing, in Baltimore City's case, without a state park, access to parks and the state uh, providing funding to um, you know, create new amenities or, or new programming uh, within the current uh, Baltimore City state park system. Thank you. Um, uh, Chairman Gazan, uh, if you have any questions, uh, obviously you've been following this as well. Um, Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we need to, we need to get off to our, our hearing now, but thank you so much for including us. We really appreciate it. Okay, thank you, uh, Senator McRae, uh, Senator Alfred, who, who helped lead the uh, commission and uh, Chairman Gazzoni. As has been mentioned earlier, there will be a bill addressing a lot of these recommendations, which I assume will be coming either to our committee or budget and tax or both. I, I don't know where it'll be assigned, but we'll be hearing more of it. So uh, thank you all. We're gonna continue with questions. Feel free to leave as appropriate a uh, budget and tax. Let's go to Vice Chair Kagan, followed by Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Elfrith, I don't know if you need to jump or whether I should um, be asking Mr. Gray or Mr. Baker or Governor Gwen Denning. Um, recommendations number 28 and 29, and I'm asking this with my 911 uh, commission hat on here. Park Services Associates as first responders, that, that means a lot of different things. And I wonder whether the commission, your commission, uh, went deeply into it. I think you said that you kind of dabbled at it, uh, wondering if you are gonna have ongoing conversations about that and whether that's something that I should be sharing uh, with the 911 commission, which is uh, making recommendations and has legislation related to first responders and our first first responders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, I'll take the first stab at that. Senator, we discussed it in depth um, and really heard all sides of this issue. We landed on a, a position of, um, of recognizing that they are performing many first responder duties within our state parks. They're often the only um, law enforcement there. Uh, and I think we landed on a, a pretty good compromise, understanding we didn't want too much mission creep in, in this report itself, but uh, all the stakeholders, from my understanding, are, are happy with the recommendation as it stands. And Andrew, or Jeremy, I'm not sure if you wanna elaborate any further. Uh, I could elaborate if that's okay, Senator. Um, there was discussion with uh, the park rangers and the park services associates union, and it's really to be used for collective bargaining purposes when they are going to negotiate their new contracts. Uh, they were also looking for specific benefits, um, most notably to be covered as uh, covered employees for workers' compensation purposes, uh, to have a occupational presumption for certain diseases that they may encounter out there uh, in the field, and also certain income tax benefits, uh, I think, that are available for retirees that were firefighters and police officers, et cetera. That's helpful. And, and, and Senator, we, we really did that for many reasons, but one of which is compared to county parks and national park staff, our state park staff are... Um, underpaid in comparison. So we wanted to provide some additional benefits for their work. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Ellis, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for your work. Uh, you know, um, I'm sitting here listening to the discussion and really quickly, uh, I have a bunch of bills coming up here and later on. And so I'll make it really brief. Having to do with parks. Uh, I serve on the program open space uh, subcommittee been there for over three years now. I've learned a lot, took a deep dive. And I see in my district, okay, all politics are local. In Charles County, we have the fourth largest city in Maryland, Waldorf. But Baltimore largest, Columbia, Germantown, and then Waldorf. And believe it or not, Waldorf have zero parks. There's no federal parks, no state parks, no county parks, nothing. And so, you know, I know uh, governor spoke about access and equity 
And I know if we're serious as a body, we have to take care of issues like this. We have to make sure all our citizens have access to parks. Not everyone can get in a car and drive 45 minutes or 45 hours to a park. You know, and so we have to really look at that. And so thank you for your work. Uh, Chairman uh, Pinsky will say, is it, will say, uh, is that so? <laughs> or whatever you say, you say better than I do. But I just want to thank you for your work. I look forward to working with you with this bill. Thank you. Yes, we do turn our statements into questions. So it is yes. not so, but don't call for an answer. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, are there other questions from uh, the committee? Uh, again, we'll be revisiting this 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 um, this research research and policy development will be turned into legislation. We can debate it. Uh, I don't know if all the recommendations or some of them are included in the bill, and the committee will have time to uh, tailor them, respond to them, tweak them as appropriate. Uh, with that, I want to thank uh, legislative services that whose work frequently goes unheralded. Uh, so thank you both for, for your work as staffing the uh, commission. Obviously, uh, Senator Elfrith has had an interest in this. And, and in fact, you know, our committee has observed this prior to the, the pandemic. Um, our parks and the short staffing of our parks, unfortunately, it's not new. Um, DNR has had a problem as well. So uh, we're glad to see this infusion and, uh, and strong focus. And uh, again, um, Governor Glenn Deming um, gives his time on smart growth, on open space. It's always been a priority of his. So uh, Paris, I want to thank you for your time and energy and uh, continued commitment to the state, to lands and, and to public service. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paris, for that work. Um, with that, that closes the briefing on uh, parks. Now we will move to, oh, uh, do we have to go to a, a different link? Yes. We okay. Senator Penske, I, once we end this, I will start the new link for the hearing. Okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen who are following at home, um, if you want to follow, there's a, another link on the website uh, committee. We will return in about 30 seconds. Thank you. This briefing has concluded. This is the hearing um, for the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. Uh, today, uh, January 25th, for those who are joining us uh, via streaming, we have uh, 11 pieces of legislation today um, uh, having to do with uh, environment, agriculture, open space, uh, a number of areas, uh, many centered around the outdoors, um, not all of them exclusively. Uh, we will be starting with um, Senator Elfrith who has a bill, Senate Bill 007, um, congratulations. Uh, invasive and native plants, classification, listing, use and sales and use tax. Um, and that will be followed by Senator Ellis, Senate Bill 35, followed by Senate Bill 56, followed by Senate Bill 96, also Senator Ellis, um, followed by 128 Senator Ellis. So um, they'll be the next four or five up. Um, the sponsor will uh, present, um, followed by their uh, lead uh, witness, uh, and then other witnesses who want to speak, who will have up to two and a half minutes. Obviously, they do not have to use all their time. They can say me too. Uh, we have 11 bills we want to hear all of them and give them the, the due time for um, the righteousness of, of the people who are uh, committed to testifying today. So with that, uh, we'll start with Senator um, Elfrith and she'll be followed by Jill, Jill Swearingen um, and then I believe Doug Myers. Uh, Senator Elfrith, welcome. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, long time no see. For the record, Senator Sarah Elfrith representing District 30. Um, I bring to you Senate Bill 007. Uh, I did not have to bribe anybody for that number. But this bill really expands on Maryland's current law and our efforts to combat invasive species and their threat to our biodiversity, to our water quality goals. Invasive species lead to increased soil erosion. They strangle our native plants. I'm going to encourage everybody. I'll 
I'll put my my district as the example. The next time you leave the state house and head out towards Route 50, and you look at the trees that are, you know, um, native oaks and other native species that are being strangled by English ivy and other vines, you'll see the real threat up close and personal invasive species pose um, to to uh, our, our native uh, our, our native plants. Um, SB7 um, is our attempt to kind of build on current law that tries to tackle invasive species and then find some creative uh, additions to it. So it does four main things. It requires the Maryland Department of Agriculture to classify all plants included in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's plant invaders of the mid-Atlantic as either tier one or tier two invasive species. Folks might uh, remember that uh, if we identify as tier one, that means they cannot be sold here in Maryland. If we identify as tier two, it means that they have to have labels that go at point of sale so consumers can make educated decisions about what they are purchasing. We strongly believe that the US Fish and Wildlife's Plant Invaders of the Mid-Atlantic is a more comprehensive listing that is uh, thoroughly um, peer reviewed and investigated and, and vetted by issue area experts. Is, is a better, more encompassing list of invasive species here in Maryland than the current list we have through MDA. Number two, it requires the Department of Natural Resources to create, maintain, and publish on its website a list of plants that are native to Maryland inquired, and in, require this list uh, to include native plants, plant alternatives to those tier two invasive species. Number three, it ensures that priority is given to native plants when we are planting projects uh, undertaken by state agencies or in projects that receive but state support. Of invasive species here in Maryland and the current list we have through MDA. Number two, it requires the Department of Natural Resources to create and, and publish on its website a list of plants. Um, it it looks like we are getting feedback or reverb or Perfect. hearing from uh, the streaming. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It wouldn't if, someone be is, if someone is streaming, please turn that off so we can hear it originally uh, from the mouth of the uh, sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It wouldn't be a virtual hearing without someone not being on mute. Okay, um, so that's number three, so that we uh, will, when we're spending taxpayer dollars, we'll be using prioritizing native plants and certainly not using invasive plants. And number four, it's kind of a creative nod to how to kind of edge or move the market in, in the better direction, which is to eliminate the sales and use tax on native plants to the state to encourage greater, uh, greater uh, usage of those native plants uh, when, when we are planting. Um, again, I just this is a visceral uh, challenge that we can all see when you're driving down the road. If you go to any farm, I represent, uh, fortunate enough to represent many farmers and they are in constant battle, losing precious acreage and losing precious time and energy combating invasive plants on their farms. This is um, a real challenge to every corner of the state. And I believe Senate Bill 7 is a solution, part of a solution to uh, achieving greater biodiversity and prioritizing native plants and stopping the spread of invasive plants. And with that, Mr. Chair, um, Jill is here. She's our issue area expert who actually wrote the, the, the literal book that we were referring to, so she can answer all the tough questions on this, but I would respectfully request a report, a favorable report from the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Elfrith. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Swearingen? Okay, I'll unmute now. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please begin. Okay, um, thank you very much for having me. Um, my name is Jill Swearingen, as he said. Um, I have been working on invasive species since 1989 when I uh, realized there was a big problem in our forest when I worked for Montgomery County. Uh, my background is I worked uh, for the National Park Service for about 23 years and just retired in 2017, so I'm pretty old. And um, I had a master's, of, a master's degree in biology from Georgia Mason University as my background, but that was long ago. And anyway, um, in the National Park Service, I was heavily involved with invasive plants, being on working groups. Ms. Swearingen, I, I would focus on the content. Then Thank you. Okay, I'll move on. I just uh, wanted to give a little background. That's perfect. Okay, so I'm here today representing the Maryland Native Plant Society, and we have a favorable view of this legislation. So just have some comments to make. 
Um, we are in favor <clears throat> of using the book, The Plant Invaders of Mid Atlantic Natural Areas as the source of the species for tier one and tier two. And um, even though it's just 80 species out of about 600, which are invasive, invasive in natural areas in the Mid-Atlantic region, it's um, a really good number, a good selection of species that are mostly from uh, introductions for horticultural purposes, the nursery trade. And these are plants that were planted and escaped into the wild. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, they're definitely the ones that are in the book are known to be invasive in natural areas. And we also report some that are um, recently showing up as being invasive. Um, we also support the weed risk assessment protocol, but it's time consuming and expensive. So we would um, encourage sufficient funding to cover the cost of assessments and um, hope that a timeline of three years um, you know, could be set for completion of the assessments. Most, as I said, most of the invasive plants um, are, were introduced for ornamental purposes, the ones that are problematic, and they're still grown by the nursery trade and available for purchase. Um, requiring Maryland DNR to create a list of native plants would be great, and uh, we really highly support that. There's, they know where the sources of those species are. Um, we strongly support, the MNPS strongly supports the requirement that funds not be used to purchase or plant invasive plant species. And uh, as I mentioned before, invasive plants spread beyond plantings into natural areas. That's how we have the problem that we have. And <clears throat> continuing to use them also sends the wrong message to the public. The last thing uh, we would like to suggest is that um, we like the idea of uh, not giving funding to uh, or have that state funding to use native plants for small, uh, for all planting projects. We think that's a great idea, but we'd like to suggest that the definition of native be defined to include local ecotypes that are adapted to Maryland ecoregions because it helps preserve our genetic diversity of our native plant species. And, um, you know, that's all I have respectfully submitted, and I'll take any questions if you have any. Okay, we're going to have uh, Doug Myers speak, who is also on the panel, and then we'll open up the questions for uh, Senator Elfrith and the Square Engine and, uh, and for Doug. Um, uh, Mr. Myers, um, welcome. Thank you, Chair and <clears throat> members of the committee. It's great to see you all again. Uh, my name is Doug Myers. I'm the Maryland Senior Scientist at Chesapeake Bay Foundation and CBF supports uh, SB7. And thanks, uh, Senator Elfrith, for bringing this important issue to our attention. Um, I have a couple points in the written testimony um, that I would like to add to. Um, native species do provide ecosystem benefits that strengthen mitigation and restoration efforts. And uh, we have found uh, in our uh, Pennsylvania 10 million trees campaign uh, that focus on native trees um, and other plant species sends a tremendous market signal uh, for the plant nurseries to carry more native plants. Uh, and so we would welcome uh, that market signal. Uh, the second point about the resiliency and adaptability of native species to reduce the need for fertilizers and pesticides, I would add to that that the native plants also are better adapted to floods and droughts uh, and the, the different water regime uh, for the area that they are native to. Uh, the native plants provide food and cover for wildlife that are critical to Bay Region's ecosystem. Um, I think that point speaks for itself. Um, as for the next point on uh, non-natives, uh, this bill is a good start. Um, and I think uh, we, we need to, in addition to what I would call stopping the bleeding with introduction of new non-native plant, non plants, is to realize that uh, disturbance, things like clearing, uh, tends to allow the, the non-native invasive plants that are already here uh, to get a foothold. So protecting our existing native um, uh, tree cover is super important for keeping invasions at bay. Um, and so just wanted to add that point. And then finally, <clears throat> um, the other threats that invasive species uh, can give to the ecosystem are oftentimes not known for many years. And so I think it's very important for us to understand uh, that every new uh, introduction could be an invasion uh, that we don't know is happening yet. 
Um, I applaud the uh, reference to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service native guide, not just because of a good list of native species, but uh, as was testified earlier, it's important to get uh, native eco, uh, uh, eco, I'm sorry, native uh, ecotypes uh, to be able to know what's the best uh, group of plants for each part of the state, uh, each soil type and things like that. Uh, so with that, again, thank you for the opportunity to testify and we're in support of HB, uh, uh, Senate Bill 7. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Uh, I'm going to open up, up for questions. I see Senator Washington. Uh, after we have these questions, we have five more proponents. There are no opponents signed up to speak or I don't think written testimony. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Senator Washington. Thank you. Um, and thank you, um, Senator Alfred, and um, thank you all those who have testified. Um, uh, Ms. Swearden and um, also Mr. Myers, um, I too support uh, native plants. Um, but however, uh, I'd like to get your take or how we can accommodate uh, the challenges of native plantings in urban spaces. So, so, uh, so I guess I'm I'm concerned about the restriction uh, of state funds uh, to be spent uh, only on uh, native trees and shrubs um, in environments that are heavily disturbed. And I know that you know this um, uh, that it's not the nativeness so much, but with the right situations, um, the plants perform well. But if a site is heavily disturbed, if the topsoil has been denuded, if it's compacted, um, you know, lots of clay, uh, acid soily, that these this will not uh, these these uh, natives are not sustainable uh, in urban contexts, and we absolutely want to um, address tree canopy challenges. Uh, is there any room, or uh, could there be an opportunity to? Um, allow uh, sort of a, um, some variation or uh, when we're, when it comes to solely planting native plants uh, when it comes to urban environments. Mr. Chair, can I just clarify something in the bill? Thank you. Senator, that's a wonderful observation. I just want to clarify that last year this committee passed a bill that says we can't use invasive plants in, in state procurement. This takes it just a hair further saying that we should prioritize native plants. So not restricting only to native plants, but certainly prioritizing them when we are spending state state funding. On the, uh, the, the nature side, I'm going to defer to the area experts. Um, okay, I'll step in first. Mr. Swearingen um, or Mr. Myers? Oh. Either one. Okay, I'll step in first. Um, uh, a lot of native plants, as long as you're um, using plants that develop, that, that evolved in an area like, say, you use coastal plain natives, um, sometimes the sites are really disturbed. So, yeah, you should probably try to do a little bit of soil mitigation to help out. But they don't do as badly as everybody thinks. And it's way better to give them a try than to keep planting all these non-natives and invasives. I mean, non-natives themselves, if they're not invasive, they're not providing the ecological support for our, as a food web for all the insects that feed our birds, you know, and on and on. And that's why we're having such a, a disastrous um, ecological impact. I, I understand, just so that you know a little bit about my background, I've served on the Board of Parks and People Foundation, I've uh, worked in this area. So I, I do actually know very well, we, we've planted uh, and have observed, have dec a decade actually of, of observation um, that there are challenges uh, to create healthy plantings in urban areas, particularly in heavily urbanized areas, it, it may not be feasible to plant communities of native plants that are found in nearby areas. So perhaps a mix of natives and exotics could be an option. I guess I'm just putting it out there that uh, to contemplate so that we can achieve this uh, goal throughout the state, um, uh, are, are there a list of plantings uh, that can, can really accommodate the fact uh, that we have con concrete contaminated clay and pH levels that are just off the chart uh, when it comes to urban environments. So um, Senator Alford, I know that that's not uh, that your bill, but I will tell you uh, that in communicating with people who are getting the grants, 
uh, it's their understanding that they cannot use non-native trees when it comes to their plantings and urban environments. So if that's not the case, I think that there needs to be some um, much more clear uh, uh, direction or, or clear statement uh, that it is that you are able to use state funds uh, if the case can be made. Thank you. I think, I that's, been duly noted. I think that's been duly noted. Thank you. Uh, Senator Gallion, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Elfrith, a, a question. Um, if, a, if a farmer uh, that takes grain to a feed mill and that grain possibly has seeds from an invasive weed that was in the field they just harvested, my question is, would that farmer have to label that grain with invasive seeds? And uh, part two of that would be, uh, if it was, would, it, would they be restricted from selling that grain? It's, it's hard to speak to a hypothetical. That's certainly not our intention here. And, and so, so I would love to work with you if you feel like we need to clarify that, that that is not our intention here. This is our, our intention was certainly to be more helpful to the agricultural community, but I, I hear you that's a possible scenario that we need to Okay, think. yeah, I, I just wanna be careful, you know, with our grain farmers. I know years ago we had an issue with uh, vomitoxin with, uh, with uh, some of the crops and they had to, you know, uh, the granaries would still take it, but they, they kind of had to segregate it out so it didn't get mixed in with the others and stuff. So I just want to make sure we're, you know, kind of covering all the bases there. So thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, we're going to go to the next group of uh, proponents. Uh, I might add that there is, shocker, a letter of information from the agency um, for my eighth year. I will repeat. Um, that the agencies of the administration have refrained from taking uh, position and giving us advice for or against legislation. Uh, I used to look to them for advice. They're the technocrats who have to implement these laws. Um, they imply their extra cost in this bill, but don't show support or opposition. Uh, hopefully next time this year, uh, whatever administration is in place will return to what used to happen in the legislature where the age, affected age agencies gave us professional advice as to the eff efficacy of the policy being proposed by uh, the senators. Okay, uh, the next group will be um, Elizabeth Miller, followed by Lily Fountain, followed by Robert Jenkins, followed by uh, Laura Banke, and finally, uh, Brian Riddle from Homestead Gardens. So uh, Ms. Miller, please unmute. Uh, thank you, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee on behalf of the Green Towson Alliance. Our organization unites Towson area environmentalists in Baltimore County to achieve a greener, healthier, and more beautiful community through collaboration and activism. We support Senate Bill 7 to expand the list of invasive plants that are regulated in Maryland. Here are some examples of how invasive plants are difficult to eradicate, threaten agricultural systems, and can have negative public health consequences. First, removing invasive plants in natural areas restores healthy habitats. Because of the aggressive nature of invasive plants, it can take months to years to accomplish significant gains. Our weed warriors free mature trees from choking English ivy but it is demoralizing to know that the same invasive vine can be purchased and planted in a Maryland garden nearby where birds will eat its berries and spread the plant right back into the very same area. Second, just last week, the Department of Agriculture expanded quarantines throughout Maryland to control the spread of Asian spotted lanternfly. Lanternflies feed on 70 different crops, but the aggressively invasive tree of heaven, the lanternfly's favorite host, is not currently listed as an invasive plant in Maryland. Finally, the invasive plants, Japanese barberry and honeysuckle play a role in spreading Lyme disease. White-footed mice make their nests under the protection of the prickly branches of barberry and in the dense roots of honeysuckle plants. Tick larvae living on the white-footed mouse pick up the bacteria that cause Lyme disease. Banning the sale of barberry and honeysuckle means less cover for the mice and more predation by hawks, fox, and owls. Fewer mice equals fewer ticks and less Lyme disease in humans. Currently, the only, I'm sorry, currently only one of the honeysuckle 
uh, varieties is banned from sale in Maryland. Please support this legislation to stem the damage I've just described being done to our natural areas, crops, and public health by invasive plants. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fountain, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the EHE Committee. I'm Lily Fountain, Chair of the Natural Places Committee of the Maryland Sierra Club, speaking on behalf of our 70,000 members and supporters across the state in strong support of SB7. We're pleased to be able to testify on this important issue. Um, during our decades of stewardship, we have witnessed an explosion of invasive plants that damage our forests and fields, costing millions of dollars. This bill would more than double the number of plants uh, prohibited from sales in Maryland. By using the report, Plant Invaders of Mid-Atlantic Natural Areas, the nursery trade consumers and government officials will benefit from a comprehensive, widely respected handbook. This bill also prescribes a list of, plant, of native plant alternatives. Benefits of the bill include preservation of native forests, which mitigate temperature extremes, increased carbon sequestration, and decreased stormwater problems, as has been mentioned, because of the diversity of native plants. And it's the, the different root depths and the deeper root depths that these types of plants have that make that happen. So why is this important? Understanding why uh, horticultural plants that are not native to Maryland are such a threat uh, helps us appreciate the impacts to our environment. Native plants co-evolve with other wildlife to create our beautiful Maryland ecosystems such as meadows, forests, and wetlands. We've all heard that monarch butterflies look for milkweed plants they co-evolved with to lay eggs upon so their caterpillars can have food to eat. But if the food sources aren't available, species will disappear, including in our cities, and endanger the native biodiversity that sustains us. Another example, if one type of bee is wiped out by disease, we need different bee species that can pollinate native plants and crops. So for the future, we hope that there will be adequate resources for the invasive plant assessments and enforcement that needs to happen. And um, we look forward to stable, thriving ecosystems and a strong Maryland economy and vibrant natural places. So thank you. And we urge a favorable report on SB7. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fountain. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, Blue Water, Baltimore. Uh, thank you, Chairman Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, Senator Alfreth, members of the Education and Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. Uh, Blue Water, Baltimore is an environmental organization whose mission is to restore the quality of Baltimore's rivers, streams, and the harbor, as well as to foster a healthy environment, a strong economy, and thriving communities within the region. A, a core part of our work is operating the Herring Run Nursery, which specializes in, in native plants. Our nursery offers more than 250 varieties of plants that are native to Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and our nursery staff is responsible for engaging and educating Baltimore communities about the many benefits and uses of these native plants. And these benefits speak for themselves and many folks have already mentioned them, but the reduction of nutrient pollutants such as net nitrogen and phosphorus, soil stabilization and the reduction of sediment loadings, mitigation of stormwater runoff, establishment of critical habitat and food for butterflies, birds and pollinators, uh, ecosystem health is increasingly important with the rising concerns over climate change and declining pollinator populations, and native plants are an integral part of a healthy and functioning ecosystem. Uh, this bill will certainly help reduce the confusion and misinformation that currently exists by definitively delineating differences between invasive and native species within Maryland, as well as providing an accurate resource for information on Maryland natives. Uh, this bill is going to aid in the development of functional microecosystems by requiring the prioritization of native plantings as part of any planting project. And this bill is going to incentivize residents to purchase native plants. Uh, we urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 7. And thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jenkins. Can we move to Laura Banke, National Aquarium? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Laura Banke. I am the Vice President of Conservation Programs at the National Aquarium, and I'm here representing both the aquarium and as the Maryland affiliate of the National Wildlife Federation. Both of our organizations request your favorable, favorable report for Senate Bill 007. Um, as you already heard, the ultimate goals of this particular legislation is to one, 
facilitate the purchase and use of native plants, which is important for all of the reasons you've heard um, previous folks testify. Um, but it also helps expand the classification of invasive plants, um, as you heard. Now, the original bill from that this is taken from was passed in 2011. Um, in the 10 years, 10, 11 years that have happened since that bill was passed, there have only been 19 species of plants that have been put on the tier one and tier two list. So less than two species per year. Um, you heard earlier that there's about 600 invasive species out there. The book that we are citing as, as the reference for invasive species has about 83. Um, absolutely, there needs to be work done to increase the list of invasive species plants in Maryland um, because it does have consequences. If you look at the fiscal note for this bill, um, at both the Maryland Department of Transportation Transportation and SHA state that they, own, they do not spend money on plants in the tier one and tier two list. But again, that's only 19 species when there are many, 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 many more that we need to not plant in this state. Um, so for all of the reasons that native plants are important, including um, our coastal habitat, coastal resilience for wildlife, we ask you for a favorable report on Senate Bill 7. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, uh, Mr. Riddle. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Senator Alfred and Chairman Penske and um, uh, Vice Chair Kagan. Um, I, overall, I, I'm very supportive of the bill and, and Senate Bill 7. I feel as if um, as a reseller of all plants, uh, ornamentals are certainly a, a substantial part of our business. But after consideration of this bill and um, looking at just the sort of the presiding trends as a, as a reseller, um, I can't see any reason to oppose the effort. I, I feel like the industry has been uh, moving in this direction for quite some time and the general will of the consumer certainly um, mirrors that, uh, that trend. And so I feel for the proponents um, and, and um, other speakers on this, this call that, uh, I can't really see a downside. My only hesitation on the bill, as I shared with the sponsors, is that the upcoming list, uh, the current U.S. Fish and Wildlife list, is 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 I believe a 2010 list. So there is a new one that is coming. Uh, my only hesitation to to support would be, you know, what's what's coming, uh, which I do not know. Um, one thing I, I would share uh, with this committee that um, you should consider on the, the exemption potential. Um, and I hear that may not, uh, that may run into some roadblocks, but I think with so many things happening in the consumer space, particularly cost uh, increases, most of our native plant suppliers are local or regional, but many are here in the state. And so I think that exemption not only gives them an advantage, but with the cost of shipping and so much of our product that comes, uh, you know, from across the country, it, it could be an opportunity to help soften uh, some of the, some of the plant material hits that, that are there. But um, I think all the elements of this bill are are, are positive for 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 our business and for our community, and, and I'm happy to support uh, Senator Alfred. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riddle. Um, question for any of the uh, panelists, uh, Senator Gallion, is your hand up from the last question, or you have another question? Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't lower the hand. That's okay. Got uh, it. Thank you. Uh, seeing no questions, uh, that concludes the hearing on 007. Thank you, Senator Alfred, for spending time with the EHE. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Okay. Senator move. Pansky, can you, can you check your chat, please? Yes. I, yes. Okay. That's been done. Okay, great. Oh, uh, so, uh, hold on. We just received the phone call. Okay. Um, Senator Ellis, we're going to have Senator Cassidy go if he has joined us. Um, I know it's a little out of order, but he's got a hearing in another. Why would um, has Senator Cassidy joined us? He's about to join us now. Okay. Uh, Senator Ellis, he's you was waiting to see.
we'll wait about 10 more seconds. If not, he can come later when he returns. He's scheduled for number six anyway, so. He's in. Okay. Uh, Senator uh, Cassily, are you with us? I am, and I'm, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm calling out my video. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna move to uh, Senate, Senate Bill 39, Senator Cassily. Uh, we've moved him up in the order. He has another committee. He's got to attend. Uh, we'll have Senator Cass This is a task force to study feasibility of returning to state meat processing inspection. Uh, he will be followed by Colby Ferguson, uh, Janelle Eck, and Scott Hipkins. And I believe uh, there is no opposition. Uh, Department of Ag, once again, will have letter of information. Uh, Senator Cassidy, you may begin. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, uh, committee members. Um, I'm here to respectfully request your support for Senate Bill 39. Uh, the chairman mentioned panel members are uh, Mr. Ferguson and Mr. Hipkins, um, who is a, a livestock farmer. Uh, uh, this legislation is intended to address the negative consequences to food security, environment, food quality, and our buy local programs uh, that are all caused by our over-reliance on large centralized meat processing facilities. Um, as you know, I'm rarely before this committee, I generally try to talk, focus my, my efforts on just proceedings related bills where I spend most of my time investigating. Um, however, in my new role as county executive, I've spent uh, quite a few hours over the past year listening to the concerns of the agricultural community in, in my county. And I really felt the need to, to respond to this critical issue. Um, and it's an issue that I'm very pleased to see is a topic of the November report from the Maryland Food System Resiliency Council, which includes as its members, Senator Hester and Dele Delegate Charcotian. Um, and as the report from their committee, the Maryland Food System Resiliency Council points out, that the current uh, global pandemic and subsequent response have highlighted and exacerbated uh, the system systemic challenges in the food system on a local and on state and national levels. So thanks to those stresses and strains of the pandemic, we now have a, a much greater and deeper understanding of the factors that inhibit our uh, goal of developing the safest, healthiest foods, most environmentally friendly, envir environmentally sound, and reliable practices in the management of our food supply chain. Uh, when our uh, state inspection program was terminated in about, I think it was 1992, um, the thought at that time was that we would streamline the regulations and standards by promoting large scale harvesting of livestock. The unfortunate result of that policy uh, change was the closure of really many of the small, probably most of the small meat processing facilities across the state. As a consequence, uh, uh, many Maryland farmers now sell their products to the major producers or they rely on facilities in, in other states. In, in my own county, uh, frequently farmers head off to Pennsylvania for their processing needs, um, especially those who are involved in the, the bi-local programs. Um, our, our, our three main butchers that we had in Harper County were all processors were all reduced to just a single one um, as we, the folks who built the Pennsylvania or the farmers sought to do their business in Pennsylvania. So the goal of this invest legislation is to investigate the potential, these potential environmental, social, economic advantages that we can achieve by expanding small local livestock processors across the state and to understand the best processes and mechanisms that are available to achieve that expansion. Now, I, you know, when, when we started this legislation, we had not conferred with the Maryland Food Resiliency Council. Um, I, I know that they're, looking at this and I look forward to any amendments that they might want to offer uh, to, to try to shape this, this bill. And I'm certainly happy to receive those. The objective here is uh, really to, to move us forward and to try to reinvigorate this, the, our local processors. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm glad to answer any questions and I refer you also to our, our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator, did I miss the results of the election? Uh, has that already been held? Uh, for county exec, no, no, we're 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 on the. <laughs> I see. I, I I guess I got confused. No, uh, I, I mean I started running, you know, actively right after the last session got out. Started listening right. to my listening tour. So I've been doing that for since really last April. So right. Okay. Um, if you can wait, let's take the testimony from your advocates, and then we'll take questions all together. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
let's hear from uh, Colby Ferguson, followed by Janelle Eck and Scott Hipkins, then we'll take questions. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau uh, here in support of uh, Senate Bill 39. Uh, we see this bill is uh, is kind of a step one, uh, a needed process to really iron out what all would need to be done to bring back the state uh, uh, meat inspection program. Uh, pretty much what, since it was uh, disbanded back in uh, right around 1990, 91, we're talking 30 years, uh, some outdated statute that would need to be updated, um, as well as to determine what kind of staff staffing would be needed at the Department of Agriculture to, to bring this back online. Um, we see this as an opportunity to really um, cross the T's and dot the I's to determine what all would actually need, what the fiscal note would look like. So just trying to uh, be a little more forward thinking here instead of just reacting to put, a, put, uh, put legislation in to, to start it up without really knowing what, what it would cost. Um, as far as why we need the bill or why we need this, uh, this inspection program, uh, we've seen a lot of our meat processing facilities um, either close up over the last couple of decades or just get to a point because of the pandemic. We've just got so many small farmers that have gotten into processing their own products and selling directly to farmers markets that they have inundated our, our processing facilities and the, and the difficulties of starting up a new processing facility, having to go through the USDA process is very, very difficult. And bringing back the state inspection program would help uh, ex expedite that process much more and keep it internal within Maryland instead of having to tra track somebody down in Virginia and Washington, D.C. and different places. So uh, we support this bill and, and encourage to move it forward. Uh, when uh, when Scott Hipkins comes up to testify after Janelle, he's here at my house. And so he'll he'll testify when you call on him. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Janelle, please. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. The Maryland Pork Producers Association is a grassroots organization of pork producers who sell their product through local and commercial markets, both in state and across the country. The pork producers support Senate Bill 39, the task force to study the feasibility of returning to state meat processing inspection, which would establish a task force. MPPA supports the bill because we believe it would be beneficial to pork producers in the state. The Maryland Pork Producers trust the current federal USDA inspection process that is in place, but with the growing demand for local pork, farmers are having a hard time getting timely slaughter and processing appointments. Starting a slaughter and processing facility is a difficult and costly process. Understanding what processing system would be beneficial to the producer, processor, and consumer is something we support. The state needs more processing capacity for the growing demand. As for producers, we strive to provide an affordable, healthy protein. Having a clear and easy program in place for new business opportunities would be very beneficial. Currently, 27 states have a state meat processing inspection program. If the task force recommends returning to a state program for Maryland, we recommend the reciprocity of selling meat to other states that is considered. It is important for our members to continue the interstate sales as we are a small state with close borders. Request your favorable report on Senate Bill 39. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, Mr. Hipkins, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Scott Hipkins. I'm a farmer in Southern Frederick County. I was a third generation dairy farmer and that ended in, nine, in uh, 2016. And since that time, I have gotten into the freezer beef market, and I have been working with a processor in Frederick County for over 40 years. And this past year, their bookings got so booked up that I have zero appointments for the whole entire coming year. So I have a dairy facility that I would love to turn into a processing facility. And that's where this Senate Bill 39 would greatly enhance my ability to take care of the customers that I already have that I, as of right now, I'm unable to take care of. I have zero appointments to process anything anywhere. And I've been within a two and a half to three hour circle of where I live looking for a point, uh, places to process me. Okay, uh, thank you. A uh, question for any of these uh, panelists or, or for the sponsor. 
uh, Senator Fry Hester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to congratulate uh, the Senator for bringing this really important bill forward. Um, it has been an issue um, during, during COVID and it is one of the recommendations of the council. My, my only uh, you know, hesitancy is that, you know, do we need another task force or can we just, can we just move forward? And I don't know if, um, if Colby Ferguson or, the, the, or, or Ms. McHenry, could they comment on whether or not the task force is necessary or whether we could jump straight back to where we were before to get this going as soon as possible? Uh, we had this question, um, uh, uh, Senator Cassidy, um, we met with uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture uh, right before session started and, and, and discussed the same thing. Um, do, we net, do we need it? We probably don't. Uh, it is a virtual session. So, you know, gathering all the what part of the statute would need to be updated to allow the, the, the department to switch back to or to start it up again. Uh, the fiscal note that would possibly come with that, um, you know, if it would be a sticker shock in this type of session, you know, I, I don't think it's a big deal from what MDA talked about. It'd probably be about six or seven employees uh, to do the inspect inspections and run the, run the program. Um, so, yeah, well, I think we can move forward with it. But at the same time, we were worried that if we put a bill in uh, without having that fiscal note number, that it might get um, bottlenecked and run out of time in a 90 day session. But if you guys feel that um, there's no need for a task force and we go ahead and move it forward, uh, we would support that. Thank you, um, Senator Ellis. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Castley, uh, witnesses. I have a question. Um, so say Mary's County uh, in the process of building, I'm not sure if it's open yet, A local processing facility. Um, is that, how does that tie into um, this bill? Uh, it seemed like, uh, well, I'll leave it at that. How would that uh, tie into that facility tie into this bill? Um, I'll take, take that for this. Okay. Um, my, so that program is Your buffering group Colby. has put in. Has uh, made, uh, Colby, you oh, can you hear me? A, I'm sorry. You're buffering for a moment. Go back about a sentence. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, wonderful internet sometimes. Um, so yes, the Southern Maryland program is is actually through that process um, uh, and should be should be completed um, relatively. But honestly, they had to go through the USDA to get that inspection process. Pandemic delayed it about two years. Uh, so something that should have taken about six months to a year max, if it, we would have had a state inspection program, uh, they're still plowing crew. And that's a that's a group that has SMATIC helping. So if you think about that, if it was just a regular farmer like Scott here uh, that was trying to do it on his own, um, it's basically a deterrent that I don't know if at this process, the process that Scott's going through is just trying to find out what USDA is going to require him to do to then have to go to the county to see if he can even if the county zoning and permitting would even allow it to be done and we're we're still waiting around on the USDA to get back to letting us know what he even needs to do so yes uh, your project is kind of that horse has left the barn but a project like that would would have not taken near as long if we'd had a state program thank you Colby Okay, uh, Vice Chair uh, Kagan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question for the sponsor of the bill. I understand that Senator Hester was hoping to maybe move this forward without a task force, but I'm looking at the composition of the task force. And I just wonder about, um, so the Attorney General um, the Attorney General's Consumer Protection Division is listed, but I wonder about um, consumer uh, representatives and whether that's school lunch programs, whether that's uh, food pantries, uh, whether that's an actual consumer of products that don't have the legal perspective, but all that. I just wonder whether you think there's enough um, inclusion uh, with just five people on the, you know, well, four 
five boxes, one, 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 and four, but they're all in, mostly all industry related. If you could speak to the composition of the task force, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Senator, for the question. So, you know, I don't, I wouldn't have any, you know, th th this committee deals with commissions of this sort every day, year in and year out. So I wouldn't presume to second guess what you all might think would be necessary to have in there. Um, uh, I mean, you, you talk about the food pantries, you know, um, the, the, the folks doing the calling the deer herd, um, that's another source that would feed into the food pantries. Um, and, and a lot of our counties are finding it difficult, you know, hunters are finding it difficult just to get anybody other than themselves to process a deer. And of course we don't, we'd rather they do that through a processor than the home, the home remedy for processing. So you can take them to the food pantries, but I, I wouldn't have any opposition to, you know, defer to the committee on um, who you think ought to be involved in the entire process. Okay, thank you, Senator Cassley. And just by mentioning the deer producers, it seems like you are passing the buck. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I guess thank you is in order. Uh, okay, um, seeing no further questions, that concludes the hearing. Thank you, uh, Senator Cassley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back uh, to the original order, Senator Ellis, Senate 35. Um, we'll start with Senator Ellis, and he will be followed by Jen Brock Consolari. Senator Ellis, you're on. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Lamori will skip the uh, actual slides. Um, so I'll just uh, give a quick introduction of this bill. And this Senate bill, uh, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair Kagan, colleagues, is to offer General Assembly approval for the program open space um, spending of state money in Charles County. Let me just say the reason for this bill is we have a city in Waldorf, which is for my research, uh, the fourth largest city in Maryland, uh, Senator uh, Kagan. You have Baltimore, almost 600,000 folks. Columbia, 104,000. Germantown, 91,000. Waldorf, 81,410, <laughs> and Silver Spring, 81,000, and so on and so forth. Waldorf is up there. Waldorf is less than 31 miles from the nation's capital, from um, Washington, D.C., a growing um, city. It's not uh, incorporated, but it's a city. It's an urban area, the largest population in base in Charles County and the fourth largest population base in Maryland. That city, that area has zero parks, no parks. As the elected Senator from Charles County representing most of Waldorf, the, my constituents are reaching out to me and say, hey, please don't allow this to continue. I've worked with, uh, uh, the, count, the county folks, at first they would meet with me, talked about this issue, and I got their attention. But you know what? It's like the urban area in Waldorf, which is majority minority, majority African American, a lot of uh, uh, Latino citizens in that uh, area, a lot of military folks, they don't have a park to walk to. Like I said earlier, there's zero parks in Waldorf. There are no federal parks, <laughs> no national parks, there are no state parks, there are no county parks, uh, no pocket parks. It's um, really unacceptable. And I put this bill in for us as a body to have a say in the planning of parks in Charles County, this is a local bill, to say that us as elected officials passing on program open space money, which is state money into the counties, we have a say in the process to make sure that we have equity throughout Charles County so that everyone can have access to a park. Now we have lots of parks in Charles County, state parks, we have federal parks, but <laughs> the closest park is um, uh, maybe an hour plus walk from the Waldorf Central Core, an hour plus walk. Imagine you're a kid trying to ride a bicycle, trying to walk to a local park, it doesn't exist. And so we have problems like that. Uh, we have the, uh, during the uh, 
pandemic, we have the <laughs> demands on park. Folks were home more, folks wanted to get out of the house, open air, fresh air, sunshine. And a lot of my constituents in Waldorf didn't have that opportunity to walk to a park. They didn't exist. And, you know, um, so this plan is to say, hey, since program open space money come through the state of Maryland, and we as a general body, general assembly, are responsible for state money, we should have a say in how that money is spent. And could I just also finish up by saying that the program open space money has been around since 1969. Now I've been blessed to serve on the subcommittee for program open space and agricultural land preservation here in the Senate for the last three years. So we've taken a deep dive in this uh, over the last three years. I understand the process. And I believe that as a body, we should be involved in actual determining that these funds, these state funds are spent in an equitable manner to bring equity to all our citizens. And so this bill, Senate Bill 35, Charles County Program Open Space General Assembly approval will put us in the process to be consulted to get this done. So I request your favorable approval for Senate Bill 35. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, let's go with uh, Jen Brock uh, Cancellieri, and then we'll take questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, you're going to see me a couple times today. Just to be clear, I'm testifying right now on behalf of Waterkeepers Chesapeake, and I would refer you to Alex Valquez's testimony. Uh, he had a last minute conflict. Um, as many of you know, Waterkeepers Chesapeake represents over 17 waterkeepers, river keepers, coast keepers. And on behalf of Fred Tutman, who I know a lot of you know, um, we really value access to quality um, parks and spaces where people can enjoy the water. And we also very much value all of the funding being given through a lens of equity. And so when Senator Ellis reached out about this bill, Waterkeepers Chesapeake was very happy to support this bill, HB 35, as it provides uh, a lens for giving funding equity, equitably to Charles County, which um, we know greatly needs these funds from program open space. So we respectfully request a favorable report and look forward to working with you as a committee and the Senator. I, I watched the briefing before this, so we know you're gonna have several bills before you about this important issue. And we look forward to partnering with you on solving that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jen, uh, let me ask a question, Senator. Um, I understand you have no parks in Waldorf, and I, I don't know why that is. I guess my question is, this bill changes who decides where the, how to spend the money and where the parks are, not whether to have a park or not. Isn't that correct? I mean, if I understand, and again, I'm not an expert on POS, you probably know a hell of a lot more than I do. Um, doesn't the local, whether it's the city or the county or the local jurisdiction, um, decide the usage of the funds? And is the question that they have either not been able to or have not chosen to build a park in Waldorf? So um, the bill's about switching responsibility, is my understanding. It doesn't guarantee there'll be a park in Waldorf. And I don't know what's driving what, um, but give me a little context, if you would, Senator. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, I'll try to uh, be succinct and uh, as clear as possible. So currently the state provide the funds through transfer taxes since 1969 to the counties. The counties through the LPPRP, Local Land Preservation Plan and elaborate process, they decide exclusively um, where this money is spent. And so basically once we turn the funds over, they decide exclusively where the money is spent in the county. And of course the spend has to go through the procurement process. You have the uh, Board of Public Works, they're involved, but they basically uh, approve what the county does. So here we are, the General Assembly 
is the most progressive deliberative body in Maryland. It's most progressive, it's more representative of folks throughout every part of Maryland. And the bureaucracies- Senator, 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 yes, your, your, Senator, Senator, your, Senator, you're buffering a little bit. Go back a sentence or two, I, we missed what you said. Um, okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, you- It's not your fault. You were buffering also, and so you <laughs> do what now? Just go, go, we missed the last sentence or two while you were buffering. Okay, great. Uh, well, yes. So uh, the counties, including Charles County, determine the um, use of these program open space funds and determine basically um, the priorities. But what I'm saying is we as a body, we are the most representative body in the state of Maryland. We are the most progressive body. But I was saying the bureaucracies, you know, they're made of career folks who were there 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. You know, they haven't kept up with the lens of equity and inclusion like this body has. And in trying to bring equity and inclusion to the distribution of these funds, it's been tremendous uh, blowback and pushback as far as dealing with uh, the uh, delegates and myself in saying, hey, let's pay attention to these urban areas, specifically Waldorf, secondarily Brian's Road. Uh, Waldorf, uh, like I said, no parks and it has been ignored. Waldorf is mainly um, Blacks and Latino citizens there and they've been ignored for forever since 1969 where these funds, billions of dollars have, have, flowed, have flowed through the program open space fund in, in Maryland. And so it's glaring that Waldorf, a large metropolitan area, urban area, I should say, have no parks. So this uh, bill is, will not cut out the counties. They still have to do the planning process as required by law, uh, uh, the initials LPPRP, Local Plan Preservation Plan. Uh, they still have to do that, but they have to work with us as a body. They have to work with the elected state officials and work with us as we represent every part of our district to make sure these funds are spread out in an equitable manner. Thank you, thank you for your answer. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank uh, let's you. go. Senator Gallion has a question, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Ellis. Uh, just a, a quick kind of a clarifying question. Is this more of a, a like a park land issue or, or would this have any effect on um, uh, agricultural preservation? Okay, um, this is, okay, the, uh, that's a good question, uh, Senator. Um, so basically there are aspects to the uh, program open space. Also the committee I serve in, the, uh, it's pr uh, program open space and agricultural land preservation. Different pots of money uh, for agricultural land preservation, different pots of money. The focus in the law for program open space is to bring open space activities to communities and populated areas. So they are separate, there are different pots of money. And you know, uh, there, right now there are no restrictions as far as what um, the counties can use the program open space money for, which the goal of the program says to bring recreational activities to communities and um, suburban urban areas. Um, so the counties can use this money for to preserve our cultural land or say forested land. And that's what Charles County is doing. Um, and their plans is to continually buy, um, buy and to purchase and preserve forested area. That's important. But when we look at communities that have real human beings in it, folks that need to walk around, need to exercise, need their kids to be able to walk or ride their bike to a park, that part of this entire uh, program is not being honored and historically never has. That's why you have this large metropolitan, large urban area in Charles County, in Maryland, have no parks. When I say no parks, zero parks. 
Thank you, Senator. You're welcome, sir. Uh, seeing no further questions and finishing our witnesses, uh, thank you, Senator Ellis and um, Ms. Cancellari. Uh, that concludes the hearing on um, SB 35. Let us go to SB 56, Program Open Space, Local Plans and Programs, General Assembly Approval. We have the good Senator, who'll be followed once again by uh, Jen Brock Consigliere, followed by Sally Dorman uh, for the proponents. And then we will move to the unfavorables uh, after that. Uh, Senator. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Lamori will skip the slides with this one also and the, uh, um, to kind of move things fast. So basically, uh, Chairman Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, members of the Education and Health Environment Office Committee, I present Senate Bill 56, Program Open Space. This bill uh, does exactly what the previous bill did for Charles County. It only make it a statewide bill. So sitting on the uh, Program Open Space and Agricultural Land Preservation Committee, um, you know, we've recognized that this is an issue um, and around the state, it's not Charles County only. So uh, senators, if you want in on the act, to have a say in how this money is spent, to be consulted, to say, hey, uh, let's make sure that all our constituents are represented. This bill will bring you into the fold. So that being said, Mr. Chairman, I hopefully that was quick and we'll, I'll get points for this with you. <laughs> and I'll return to ask for a favorable uh, vote on Senate Bill C uh, 56. Uh, yes, I, I'm sure you get points, although the, the list of unfavorable signups uh, is fairly extensive. Uh, let's go to the other two proponents, uh, Ms. Bracca Consigliere, uh, followed by Sally Dorman. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, members of the committee, I will be equally brief. Again, we thank Senator Ellis for his leadership. Waterkeepers Chesapeake has, again, 17 um, waterkeepers and riverkeepers and coastkeepers, and they, just like the prior bill, support the intent of this legislation and look forward to working with the committee to resolve the important issues of equity around program open space funding distribution. We urge a favorable report on SB 56. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, Ms. Dorman, then we'll take questions for this uh, Senator Ellis's panel. Hi everyone, my name is Sally Dorman and I'm the Director of Regional Partnerships and Programs at Kaboom. And I wanna start by thanking Chairman Pinsky and members of the Senate Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee for the opportunity to testify today and to also thank Senator Ellis for his leadership on the bill. On behalf of Kaboom, the national nonprofit dedicated to ending place-based inequity, I support SB 56 and Senator Ellis's goal to ensure equity in the distribution of program open space funds in Maryland. As we see in our work every day, local community parks are critical opportunities to build quality play spaces where all children can thrive. And we define place-based inequity as the lack of access to quality play spaces as a result of systemic racism and historic disinvestment in communities of color. And as you can see from the document attached in our testimony, we've created a model for addressing place-based inequity that uses data and mapping to identify where place-based inequities exist. And then we work with part with, in partnership with kids and communities to design and build vibrant, custom, state-of-the-art place spaces that reflect their unique culture and community in order to address equity gaps like the one in Waldorf that Senator Ellis mentioned. Um, and ultimately our goal is to ensure that every kid has access to a great place to play where they feel safe, welcome, and included. So we urge uh, Senator Ellis and this committee to consider further defining equity in the legislation, as well as how the Maryland legislature can ensure program open space funds are equitably distributed. And we respectfully urge a favor report on Senate Bill 56 with amendments addressing our concerns and thank Senator Ellis again for his leadership. Okay, um, questions for um, Senator Ellis or the panel who'd like to make this a statewide bill. Uh, essentially shifting authority for spending of POS money to the uh, senators in the respective districts. Um, questions? Um, my screen is frozen. Hmm. We see you and hear you just fine, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, any questions 
Seeing none, we'll go to the unfavorables uh, and the vice chair will start calling on those people. Um, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have four witnesses uh, who are here to testify against this bill. We'll lead with Rosalind Johnson, Baltimore County Department of Rec and Parks. Ms. Johnson, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, Hello. everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today in opposition to SB 56. Um, I am the Director of Recreation and Parks for Baltimore County, and program open space is a lifeline for the 23 counties and Baltimore City. This valuable funding allows jurisdiction to both develop and acquire land. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we've witnessed unprecedented attendance at local parks throughout Maryland and the nation. In Baltimore County, we've had park usership increase as much as 224% during the pandemic, thus demonstrating the value our residents place on parks. They were a safe haven during the pandemic, a getaway from the stressors of daily life. Across Maryland, this pandemic has widened the gap for underserved populations and has made it more evident than ever. Directors across Maryland are beginning to look at equity and environmental equity in a very different way. We realize we did not get here overnight, and as such, we will not depart from a non-equitable place overnight. But we're making strides by first acknowledging it and addressing it in our land preservation and parks and recreation plan through the state's equity mapping tool. And in addition, Baltimore in Baltimore County, we use the Social Vulnerability Index through the CDC. Since 2019, our department was able to acquire 192.4 acres of parkland for Baltimore County residents and visitors by acquiring 13 parcels of land, all funded almost 100% by program open space funding. We were able to acquire these parcels by moving quickly, well, quickly for government standards, once they came on the market. While this program may not be perfect, it's pretty close and provides jurisdictions throughout Maryland a way to fund property acquisitions and development. POS gives local government the autonomy to act quickly, to begin to acquire property given the guidelines, as well as the flexibility to reevaluate property acquisitions and development based on op obstacles or unforeseen circumstances. Often appraisals come in lower than sellers expect, environmental concerns are presented, or any other myriad of possibilities could present that force jurisdictions to be unable to move forward and instead sent their sights on other properties or development projects. The proposed legislation would significantly hinder the program open space process, in some instances, make it unusable. This bill would make the POS annual program and any subsequent amendments to the program subject to review and approval by the General Assembly. This would slow down, in many instances, paralyze the POS process significantly, and by our estimates, add a year to projects, thus causing jurisdictions to lose the ability to purchase parkland and develop recreational amenities. The stars would have to align much in the way of a rare shooting star between an available property, the General Assembly being in session, and Ms. having approved POS annual program with the acquisition included. Ms. For many jurisdictions, POS is the only way to acquire land for residents and future generations to enjoy. Please do not take this necessary resource, parks, away from residents and visitors of Maryland by supporting this bill. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for reading fast. I just wanted to remind all the rest of the witnesses that we have a lot of bills yet today and that everyone gets two and a half minutes and we are watching the clock if you could. So um, Ms. Johnson was from Baltimore County Rec and Parks. Next up is Reginald Moore from Baltimore City Rec and Parks. Welcome, Mr. Moore. You have two and a half minutes. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Pinsky, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Pinsky, uh, Vice Chair K Kagan and members of the committee. Please be advised that Baltimore City Administration and Rec and Parks oppose Senate Bill 56. Baltimore City Recreation and Parks has three, three pillar focuses, which are conservation, health and wellness, and social equity. Every year, Baltimore City Recreation and Parks undergoes an extensive application process to determine agencies' priorities and use of the program open space funding. Each capital budget year, we present our list of priorities to each elected official within the various states that make up Baltimore City state delegation. Our list of capital improvements projects began with an internal discussion that provides a clear focus on equity as part of our scorecard. Each potential project is scored and ranked based on an evaluation criteria that prioritizes equity first, public, and health public health and safety second, and environmental stewardship. The, C the capital improvement process is then presented to the Baltimore City Planning Commission, the mayor's office, and then approved by the Baltimore City Board of Education. As you can see, Baltimore City Rec and Parks um, plan and process is clearly an open and transparent process. 
And finally, to add, an additional uh, application layer elongates the thorough and proven approval process already in place in Baltimore City. Respectfully, we request an unfavorable report on Senate Bill 56. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Moore. And we have our local governments represented. Dominic Butchko from MACO, the Maryland Association of Counties is next. Welcome, Mr. Butchko. Thank you. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Dominic Butchko and I'm the Associate Director at the Maryland Association of Counties. MACO asks the committee give FB56 an unfavorable report. Um, in 1969, Program Open Space was created with the intent of ex uh, expediting the acquisition process of outdoor spaces before land becomes too expensive or, because, or before it's taken for other uses. It was also develop, uh, brought on to uh, accelerate development and the capital renewal um, of needed outdoor recreational facilities. In the 53 years since the program has been uh, implemented, the state and counties have been immensely successful in meeting these goals. Uh, DNR has even highlighted that home values increase uh, faster when they're near parks and new businesses prefer communities with healthy environments. Historically, the General Assembly has played a visioning role, passing legislation to prioritize the balanced goals of land preservation and active resident access. A hallmark of program open space has been the speed and discretion it grants to local counties in expanding access to active and outdoor recreational spaces. The bill would compromise that local economy by effectively granting the General Assembly a veto over those local plans. This veto could create and would create significant delays and could harm economic development, land acquisition, upgrades to our parks, the purchase of necessary equipment, et cetera. In short, SB 56 would undermine a very productive state and local collaborative model of one of our state's showcase policy innovations and program open space. And accordingly, MAKO requests an unfavorable report on SB 56. Thank you, Mr. Butchko, for your testimony. When did you join the staff of the Maryland? Uh, in, in August. So. Nice. Well, welcome aboard your first uh, session. I hope we will keep you on your toes. And uh, EHE tries very hard not to use acronyms. So for anyone who's watching, DNR is the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, oh, thank you. I'll note that for next time. Absolutely. It's just, we can all be alphabet soup and not even remember. So it's all good. Uh, well, congratulations and good luck to you. Uh, Angelica Bailey from the Maryland Municipal League. Wrap us up, please, for this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Hi, everyone. Great to be with you again. Angelica Bailey, Director of Government Relations for the Maryland Municipal League in respectful opposition to Senate Bill 56. Understanding the committee's preference for no abbreviations, but um, with respect for everyone's time, I might use them anyway. I'll do my best not to. Um, really, this, this bill is really going to mess up the approval process for us. The program open space process was intended to be quick and efficient. This bill would absolutely slow that down. As others have alluded, um, a local government's proposed open space program is made of three parts, the land preservation and recreation plan, the annual program, and the project application. Each part is reviewed by state planning, DNR, and the General Assembly, and the Board of Public Works gets involved for one of those pieces as well. The General Assembly does not need to approve the plans, but legislators do have several opportunities to review and provide comments. But this bill changes the process to require General Assembly approval, not just review. That complicates things, slows us down without really a clear benefit. We wouldn't be able to submit the third piece, that project application to BPW until the General Assembly passes legislation approving the first two pieces. And what otherwise takes place on a rolling basis throughout the year could really only happen after session, but before the end of the fiscal year, which is only a three month window, which is an incredibly small time frame to put together and turn around an application. And you know, if we can't make that deadline or BPW is overburdened, which would be likely, then we would have to wait for another year for the bite of the apple. If oversight is the concern, there's sufficient oversight here already. Three different pieces have to come together, all of which have strict criteria. They get reviewed and analyzed by multiple state agencies. General Assembly participation is obviously valuable to the process, but there are ample opportunities for that already. So this bill would really just slow things down without an obvious value. And finally, we fear that this could open the door for political retribution in jurisdictions where maybe local governments and their delegations might not have the strongest working relationship. So for these reasons, we respectfully request an unfavorable report. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Always good to have our municipalities uh, speaking out here. And I apologize, colleagues. I 
Uh, Steve Miller was on the proponents page, but he has clearly signed up uh, unfavorable. He's with the Maryland Association of County Parks and Rec Administrators. Mr. Miller, I apologize. Uh, you may begin your testimony. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Steve Miller. I am the president of another um, acronym here called MACPRO. We're an association of recreation and parks professionals that represent the 23 counties and Baltimore City. Um, what I have to share is similar to what you've heard, but MACPRO as an association of recreation and parks professionals opposes this bill for two primary reasons. Um, number one, this would eliminate local control of the program. And that's been one of the strong points and the hallmarks of program open space success over the years is that local communities can meet local needs. Uh, the second as has been noted is that this bill would um, add significant amounts of time to both development and acquisition projects under program open space. And that would possibly uh, at the very least delay projects, but could also eliminate um, acquisition opportunities and, and other opportunities where counties um, and municipalities through the counties need to have that flexibility to be able to pivot and to execute projects. So for those reasons, MACPRA uh, would respect respectfully uh, ask for an unfavorable report on this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, colleagues, I see no hands raised for questions for the opponents other than the sponsor of the bill. Okay, uh, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And so um, I have a question for, I think Angelica and Dominique. So um, in both of your testimonies, you indicated about how the system is very efficient now and it goes smoothly. And so our body would just muck things up. We're inefficient, we will block things. Um, every year um, we get out a budget, $50 billion um, in an efficient manner. Um, so why would us as elected officials who are respected by our constituents and is sent to Annapolis to do a job for them, why would be necessary for efficient system to exclude us from looking out for our constituents? Why is efficiency so much more important than say, us doing our jobs, making sure that things are equitable throughout the state of Maryland? Senator Ellis, are you directing that to one witness or well, should one of them um, choose to answer? Madam Vice Chair, both uh, hit on that point. So I don't know if one will speak or it's up okay. to who speaks. From among the opponents, could we hear from just one of you with an answer? Who feels most qualified to answer that? Who spoke about efficiency? So uh, actually, um, Madam Vice Chair, if I may, uh, so we have three people from parks here who understand the process so much better than I do. Would you mind if we open it up to one of them, potentially Rosalyn, because she has- Rosalyn or Mr. Moore, would you like to speak to this briefly, please? Sure, um, it, it's not only about efficiency, it's about the ability to do it. Um, sellers often will not want to keep their property on the market for over a year for jurisdictions to be able to purchase that property. So since the POS annual program is occasionally amended or added to remove projects for which POS funds could be requested, having to get general assembly approval for such amendments, which could happen at any point throughout the year, will be unduly res restrictive since the annual legislative session does not span the calendar year. So at present, annual programs are due by July 1st of each year and the bill does not revise that due date. So as such, the annual program submitted in late June would effectively have to wait until the next legislative session, some six to seven months later, in which case properties and development projects would have to be off the table. We can't simply, we simply can't hold them that long. So it's not efficiency, it's the ability to be able to even use program open space funds. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Seeing no other hands, that completes the hearing on Senate Bill 5-6. We have two more bills from Senator Ellis. And next up, Senator, if it's uh, okay with you, we'll continue in numerical order and we will hear Senate Bill 96, Community Parks and Playgrounds Program, Charles County Basketball Courts. Uh, Senator, you may begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair um, Kagan and uh, Senator Chairman Pinsky and colleagues. Uh, continue on the theme of lack, lack of equity, lack of access. <laughs> 
Senate Bill 96 will require Charles County to put basketball courts in its parks. Right now, the parks in Charles County, if you have, say, eight parks, big parks, maybe only one have a basketball court and very substandard. You have these parks that have baseball fields, soccer fields, but no basketball court. And so I would love to kind of quickly uh, ask Lamoria if she could share the screen with the presentation. Uh, sure, give me one second. I'm thank you, Pam. Yeah. And while you do that, I just I got a text from uh, our former colleague, Senator uh, Zirkin saying, hey, you know, <laughs> great idea, great bill. We need basketball courts in all our parks. I'll be in Charles County to do some games with y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, thank you, uh, uh, our former colleague, Senator Zirkin. So Senate Bill 96, Community Parks, Playground Program, Charles County Basketball Courts. So the parks we do have, the parks where kids and families have to drive to in Charles, in Waldorf, even when they drive there, the Kids, the families, parents have no option of playing basketball. You know, um, next slide, please. So the purpose of Senate Bill 96 allows for the expansion of the community parks and playground program to make grants available to Charles County for the construction of and maintenance of basketball courts with baseball fields. So if a park has baseball fields, this will say, hey, put basketball court in there also. Now, I just want to say that the Community Parks and Playgrounds Program is a park, is a program that's to uh, fund programs like this. And so we would expand that program to get the monies that have an unfunded mandate. Next slide, please. What's the benefits of having basketball court? Oh. I think uh, you advance, uh, Lamoria, three slides forward. Um, could you go back, um, I think back one more? Yes, right there, benefits of SB 96, thank you. The, yeah, benefits of uh, having basketball courts in all local parks in Charles County will be to construct and maintain courts at parks that has baseball fields. They'll improve and rehabilitate, expand or maintain existing parks. You could also buy land and playground equipment to develop new parks. So you don't have to have a park that's uh, you know, 500 acres or 50 acres. It could be a pocket park that uh, we use this money to put a basketball court in a neighborhood. Could I just say last year, this our body, in the state of Maryland, uh, we passed a bill by a senator from uh, Tacoma Park uh, to say, hey, uh, communities can't ban folks from having a portable basketball court in their driveway. Somehow uh, we have an issue with our, in our communities where you know, um, people who play basketball are very much uh, discriminated against in that uh, folks try to contain them and try even as a government in Charles County, like I say, as a government made the decision not to put basketball courts in 90 plus percent of our parks. So it's a question of equitable equity. And this bill, Senate Bill 96, will sustain environmentally oriented parks and recreation projects and get folks off the streets, away from the TV set, into parks to play whatever sports they want. In this case, for them to be able to play basketball. Next. Side piece, please. Who does SB 96 affect? Would directly affect the citizens of Charles County with special emphasis on the youth. Youth sports such as basketball can increase agility, balance, and coordination. Additionally, youth sports can aid in improving social skills and provide an enjoyable and effective way to exercise. And you have recreational facilities as a whole can improve community wellness, create safe gathering space, and even encourage family and community bonding. And so, next slide, please. 
So we have lots of worksite research on the benefits of sports and basketball exercise. And if a kid wanna go out and play basketball for 15 hours and make it to the NBA, we want them to have that choice also to get out there and have basketball courts to fulfill whatever dream desire they might have. So colleagues, uh, thank you for uh, hearing this presentation and I ask for your support, your favorable support for Senate Bill 96. Thank you, Senator Ellis. We have two proponents and one opponent. The lead proponent is going to be Michaela Wilkes, Schools Not Jails. Ms. Wilkes, you, if you are here. I'm sorry, Senator Kagan, she will not be testifying today. I do believe it's only gonna be Mr. Childs testifying. Okay, then our witness will be Carlos Childs, Our Revolution, Southern Maryland. Mr. Childs, welcome to EHE. So glad to be here. Um, thank you so much, Chairman uh, Pinsky, Vice, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the uh, EHE Committee. I wanna thank uh, Senator Ellis for putting this bill up. Uh, um, my name is Carlos Childs with our, I'm the Charles County Chair of Our Revolution Southern Maryland. Uh, we are favorable with amendments to this bill. Uh, we do support having uh, expanded recreational facilities, especially as the Senator said, right now we have a lot of baseball fields, but do not have anything past that really. So um, our amendments for this bill would be to expand it. So it just doesn't cover uh, or it just doesn't add basketball courts. It also adds tennis courts, also adds uh, track fields and soccer fields as well. Because uh, as we all, all know, people don't, don't just play two sports. People play a multitude of sports. Um, I'll give a personal story. When I moved to uh, Waldorf in fourth grade, um, I, I originally lived, lived in uh, Prince George's County. I was really big into tennis. When uh, we moved here, my mom found out the only places you can play tennis at was the public schools uh, at, at North Point here. They had a tennis court or you had to hope that your uh, neighborhood HOA put one in. And as we know, having activities in public schools is now a very, very big uh, health concern with a COVID going on. You're having multiple people from, from different areas coming, coming in. Uh, also, it is very seldom that you will find uh, neighborhoods having things like basketball courts, tennis courts, track fields, especially, or soccer fields, when um, having these, these, these expanded programs offered at a multitude of uh, public parks and recreational areas. One, uh, lowers crime, because we have more uh, youth and more uh, people actually going out in the community doing something uh, with their uh, time and not just, just being idle, but it also offers a more community environment as well. Um, you have many senior residents who would love to just go walk around the park and watch people play basketball, watch people uh -oh. as well. Oh, is it working? Can you all hear me now? Okay, we're back, yep. Oh, sorry, sorry about that, sorry about that. You're so back. definitely having people do um, activities. So I would just like to wrap it up by, by saying again, thank you, thank you so much, Senator Ellis, for bringing this bill in. Uh, we would like to ask for a favorable the um, amendments that we have uh, previously stated. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Childs. Appreciate your testimony. And Angelica Bailey is back from the Maryland Municipal League as an unfavorable witness again. Ms. Yeah. Bailey. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair. Hello, everyone. Again, Angelica Bailey, Director of Government Relations for the Maryland Municipal League in respectful opposition of Senate Bill 96. This bill expands the community parks and playground program within DNR to make grants available to Charles County for basketball courts. Um, you know, this really isn't about basketball or the importance of recreation. For us, it's about giving a county special permission to access a very small fund that's held specifically for municipalities. The Community Parks and Playground Program was established in 2004 and funded at just $5 million a year. And originally, both counties and municipalities could apply, but over time, more and more funding in the program started going to the counties. In 2006, the whole pot all $5 million went to the counties with nothing left for the municipalities. So seeing the problem, the General Assembly passed a bill in 2009 that restricted the fund to municipalities only. And then the pot was reduced to $2.5 million in, 2000, um, in 2011, where it's mostly stagnated. And 2.5 million funds about 20 municipal programs a year, but DNR gets, I'm sorry, the Department of Natural Resources gets way more than that. On average, DNR gets applications for 75 projects totaling around $9 million every year. And for FY23 specifically, they got 69 grant applications for a total of 9.3 million in funding. There just isn't enough to go around. 
By contrast, total county program open space funding over the last few years has grown from $37 million in FY18 to $77 million this year. And Charles County received over $4 million from program open space in FY22. Municipalities do also have access to program open space, but their application has to go through their county. And in Charles County's case, none of their POS money went to their municipalities. So we're also a little concerned about a snowball effect. If this bill passes, what's to say that other counties won't be next? But this is really about limited resources for us. Letting someone else have a bite at the apple means there's less apple for the rest of us, and the apple is already pretty small. So for these reasons, we respectfully request an unfavorable report. Unfavorable report. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Appreciate your testimony. Seeing no questions, that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 96. We have one more hearing, one more bill from Senator Ellis. That is Senate Bill 128, Charles County Program Open Space Waldorf Core Zone. Senator Ellis, you may begin. Um, Madam Vice Chair, thank you very much. Chairman Pinsky, uh, colleagues, this bill summarizes all the stuff you heard before, so it'll be really quick <laughs> from my presentation point of view. You've heard about Waldorf, the fourth largest urban area in Maryland with no parks, no parks, no parks. And you know what Ellis does? Ellis does something about it. We have to end this inequitable. We have to do something about how our state money is used. We start out with a briefing today at uh, one o'clock talking about parks and how to make our parks better and bring equity. We are working on the parks issue. We will get more money to the parks. Maryland has a $6 billion budget surplus as told to me by our controller, $6 billion budget surplus. We have money to work on these issues and we have to make sure equity is part of it. So Senate Bill 128, which I bring before you and ask for your favorable vote on Senate Bill 128 is Charles County Program Open Space, Waldorf Core Zone. We define the core zone of Waldorf because it's not incorporated. We define where it is. And we define this area around Waldorf and say that for the next 10 years, this $4 million a year, which goes to Charles County, have to go into Waldorf to create parks to end this inequitable in, in, uh, in injustice. We just cannot say, we don't wanna share the resources. We don't wanna share the resources. Oh, it's not enough. We will get the resources. We must share it. We have to share it. These are our voters. These are our constituents, whether it's Charles County, whether it's Baltimore City, whether it's in you know, Montgomery County, Gaithersburg, doesn't matter. We have to share the resources with all the members of our community, especially our black citizens, especially our Latino citizens. We have to clean up the streets. We have to put parks in the neighborhood. We have to do better so our citizens can have better health and better outcome instead of always just have concrete to play basketball on, just to have the streets to walk on. We can do better. We must do better. We must end this inequitable inequity. We have the money. The money is flowing. The people who have monopolized this for all these long time, all these decades, hundreds of years, they need to say, hey, let's share the resources with all our communities. The common theme is, it's not enough money and we don't wanna share it. We don't wanna share it. And who's at the losing end of that? We don't wanna share this. This is our black communities, especially. We must share the resources and Senate bill 128 says in this area, the fourth largest city in Maryland, <laughs> at parks, <laughs> but get uh, resources. The money is available. It's about priority and us as statewide elected officials, we are responsible for the state money. And so we have to be part of the solution. So colleagues, thank you very much for listening. This is the last bill I do believe I have today. I know you were happy to hear that. And I'll uh, thank you again for listening. And I'll uh, turn over to Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Senator Ellis. And thank you for your passion. You are, you are a dedicated representative of the, of the residents of Waldorf and all of uh, 
and all of your district, uh, District 28. Uh, we do have Dexter Bordas, uh, DM&T Development, who is your lead witness. Mr. Bordas, I saw that you are here. You may begin and you get up to five minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, yes, Senator Ellis is passionate. Uh, he's a passionate parent. Um, his um, kids grew up here in Waldorf and um, and before I, I speak, um, my children uh, grew up in Waldorf also, and um, uh, the uh, and, and and just to support uh, what uh, uh, the testimony of uh, Mr. Childs is that um, we had a tennis league, um, and that tennis league had to travel thirty miles each way uh, to Prince George's County uh, in order to participate um, in a tennis program, either at Costco Park or. Uh, Watkins Park. Uh, and there were a lot of kids that were, uh, like I said, they had to travel uh, an hour a day just to start practice. Uh, so we didn't have those opportunities, swimming pools and other recreational facilities. Uh, but I'm here today. Uh, thank you to all the senators and delegates. Uh, my name is Dexter Bordas. I'm here um, uh, to represent the Westlake Business Association. Um, we represent the, the uh, businesses and the uh, citizens around uh, the Charles County Mall area. Uh, Westlake, our association has been um, in existence for almost 35 years, and probably for the last 15 years, our goal has been to create open space uh, here uh, for the citizens and businesses to enjoy. So uh, we have plans to establish a park around O'Donnell Lake, allow the citizens a one-mile running walking trail uh, area for um, uh, the start of the Indian Head 28-mile uh, uh, bike trail, uh, community event platform, uh, amphitheater, uh, all of these um, are, are, are um, would be in this park. So for years, we've looked to the county and the state to provide funding. Our hopes lied in the transfer tax that was created to generate open space for our citizens. The transfer tax generated, however, um, did not translate into parks for, for our community. Um, we're probably one, we are the most heavily populated area uh, in the entire county and probably, as yeah, Senator Ellis would say, the fourth, fourth largest area um, uh, in the state of Maryland. Um, so it's reasonable to assume that uh, enough, enough taxes have been generated to provide open space for our community. Uh, since the inception of open space in 1969, over 3,100 parks have been built. Uh, we believe it's reasonable to request that a park should be built in our area. Our Donald Lake project has support of the uh, Charlestown Center um, and several businesses in the community have committed uh, funds uh, for this park. This will make a perfect public-private partnership where open, open face, uh, space funds would be maximized. So we support Bill 128 in hopes that our Donald Lake project will be a priority. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. Sorry, I've got some stuff going on. Um, appreciate your testimony. Carl Childs is next. Mr. Childs, welcome. And again, you've got two and a half, up to two and a half minutes. Thank you, thank you, thank you back again. Uh, so yes, again, Carlos Childs uh, with Our Revolution, uh, Southern Maryland, the Charles County Chair. Uh, we are favorable on uh, SB 128. Uh, we agree with um, what was previously stated. I mean, Waldorf is is expanding. Uh, we are the the central hub of of Charles County, and I would even go go as far as say Southern Maryland as well. Um, and right right now, we are seeing a rapid increase in single family and townhomes, but we are not seeing seeing the same rapid increase of um, outdoor uh, recreational areas as well. I mean, you have. You have multiple single family houses where where people can't even have anywhere to walk around, nowhere to 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 play or do anything. And people are really left with their their own um, HOAs and neighborhoods, basically supplementing their um, all around life. So uh, our main reason for uh, supporting this bill is really bringing Waldorf up into the uh, 21st century, being able to have somewhere you can play, live and work as well. Um, so without belaboring the uh, point. We we deserve just just as much as uh, Prince George's County as they have a uh, sports complex there and other outdoor recreational facilities. We deserve the same thing here in uh, Waldorf. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Childs. And the last witness we have is Jen Brock Cancellari, who's back representing the Maryland Sierra Club. 
Ms. Brock Cancellari, are you here? I am. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. So switching hats this time on this bill, Sierra Club, the Maryland chapter, and Rosa Hance, who's the chair who lives near Waldorf, supports this bill and asks for a favorable recommendation. I refer you to their written testimony. They essentially wanted me to convey that they think it's really important that program open space investments be made with serious consideration for social equity because all the residents of Maryland deserve access to um, natural spaces and recreational spaces. They do recognize, Maryland Sierra Club recognizes that there are many areas and needs and that they urge all levels of governance to work together to find responsible ways to invest and prioritize in these areas with an equity lens and, um, and identify the greatest needs and the greatest impact for limited program open space funds. So we, we look forward to working with the committee on this critical issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brock Cancellari. Colleagues, do you have any questions on Senate Bill 128? Seeing none, I'm passing it. That completes the hearing on, on this bill. Thank you, Senator Ellis. Thank you, witnesses. And I'm passing it back to Chairman Pinsky. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Senator Carosa, Senate Bill 32, Worcester County, public safety buildings used for agritourism. Uh, Senator Carosa will be followed by uh, Diana Purnell and Kevin Addix, who will then be followed by Colby Ferguson and Melanie Purcell. And um, there is no opposition. Uh, please welcome uh, Senator Croza. Uh, you're on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair uh, Kagan, and my colleagues and friends on the Senate Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee um, for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 32 on National Plan for Your Vacation Day. This bill simply adds Worcester County to the list of jurisdictions in which farm structures used for agritourism activities are exempted from certain requirements generally applied to commercial buildings. I am supporting this legislation with an amendment to change the effective date of this bill to June 1st so we can maximize the summer tourism season and hold, holding up the Maryland coast uh, to welcome you all um, soon to um, our district. Specifically, this legislation would exempt an agriculture building in Worcester County used for agritourism from obtaining a change of occupancy permit if the building's use of agritourism does not require it to be occupied by more than 200 people at any one time. Now, many of you have enjoyed the beautiful farm landscape driving east along Route 50 on your way to Ocean City or driving south on Route 113 from the Delaware line into Worcester County, giving you a glimpse of the many multi-generational family farms in my district. This legislation is a win-win for both the farm families who may need to diversify and pull in additional revenue just to keep the farm and a win for tourists who will have more options to explore and experience our local farms. I especially am proud of the leadership of the Worcester County Commissioners and their Office of Tourism for the extra effort they have been making to give our farm families more options to diversify and expand rather than selling their valuable farmland for development. Senate Bill 32 would be a successful in giving more local farms the opportunity to protect their way of life in new and creative ways. Now, Worcester County will be joining 18 other local jurisdictions in making similar exemptions to secure this agritourism building exemption through Senate Bill 32. And I'd like to point out that this local bill has broad and strong support from the Worcester County Commissioners and its tourism office, the Greater Ocean City Chamber of Commerce, the Ocean City Hotel Motel Restaurant Association, Maryland Tourism Coalition, the Maryland Farm Bureau, and grow and fortify and value added agriculture. So I respectfully request my colleagues and friends on the Senate Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee for a favorable report for Senate Bill 32 as amended. It is an important local priority for Worcester County. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Carosa. Uh, let's have County Commissioner Purnell. Uh, welcome to Annapolis, albeit virtual. Uh, you're muted, ma'am. You need to unmute, uh, Commissioner Purnell. Now, uh, it's, you're, you're back. Yep, you're good. Well, um, you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you, ma'am. 
why don't why don't we come back to you in a minute? You want to try it now? Try now. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman. I am Diana Prennell, Commissioner of, of, of the Worcester County Commissioners, and I'm seeking your support for Senate Bill 32. Family farms, they are the heart of the rural life in Worcester County. And thanks to the growth of agritourism market, family farms are also a key component in Worcester County's tourism branding. Because I grew up on a farm, I understand the limited wisdom of a window of opportunity that those who cultivate the land face when struggling to eke out a living. Once the crops were in and the weather changed, the revenue stream dried up. Due to that stark lack of income, farm families previously had no choice but to leave the farm to earn an income. But thanks to the birth of agritourism, Today, the economic picture of many farm families is growing brighter. Today, farmers are being granted more flexibility to incorporate new and innovative activities that complement existing agricultural land uses, thus assuring that their land will remain economically viable year round. By adopting SB, SB 32, we will grant farmers the flexibility they need to use existing structures as venues for agritourism related activities, from, taste, from tasting rooms for wineries to barn weddings set against the backdrop of horse farms, these new activities will assure that farms can remain economically viable, entice those inheriting the land, inheriting the land to continue farming, and educate those from less rural areas about the value of farming. In closing, I thank you for your time today and ask you to join us in support of SBL 32. Thank you for joining us, uh, Commissioner Burnell. Uh, Kevin Attic, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Good to see you all. Um, all of the words have been spoken by the Senator and the Commissioner already. I will add one thing, and that is uh, Grow and Fortify is focused on value added agriculture and of value added agriculture and all the many segments, agritourism is one of the fastest growing uh, and it helps to represent that $875 million in direct impact to the state uh, from value added ag. And the last thing I will say is that this exception to the building code has become, if you look at the list of counties in the bill that already allow it, it has become normal and customary and it is critically important, especially in rural counties especially in the in the lower shore and you look at parts of Worcester County which um, really in the off season there are incredible farms there but they're not able to make use of their uh, beautiful buildings and historic buildings and this would allow them to do so so uh, on behalf of uh, agritourism and value-added ag we request your support for SB 32 thank you thank you uh, Mr. Addicts uh, let's go to Mr. Ferguson followed by Ms. Purcell Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau, and we support uh, Senate Bill 32, uh, a bill that uh, is not, not to this committee. I think for the last uh, several years now, we've had uh, bills to add different counties uh, to, this, to this part of the statute. Uh, this bill is uh, adding Worcester County to allowing up to 50 people into, a, into an existing structure. Uh, we've had bills uh, that would allow like Carroll County and different ones that allow up to 200. So this is kind of like baby steps. This is like the bunny slopes here uh, to allow these existing structures to, to fit within that. Uh, I've got a barn in, in the background of my, my video here to kind of show, uh, outline what we're talking about, but um, to allow these ex existing structures to be used uh, to not just have tractors or farm equipment in them, but uh, in the fall, uh, when when individuals maybe want to do a pumpkin patch or or corn mazes and things like that and want to utilize the structures uh, to help accentuate that uh, that experience uh, that, that would allow it uh, in Worcester County. So um, counties such as Allegheny, Anne Arundel, Baltimore, Calvert, Carroll, Cecil, Garrett, Howard, Kent, Prince George's and St. Mary's already allow this and we're just adding uh, Worcester to it. So we would encourage a favorable for it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ferguson, uh, Ms. Purcell. Hi, thank you so much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, um, Madam Vice Chair, members of the Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. 
Uh, my name is Melanie Purcell. I'm actually the director of the Worcester County Office of Tourism and Economic Development. And we respectfully request your support of this bill for all of the aforementioned reasons. Um, I don't wanna to reiterate too much more, but I think um, it's very timely for us as well. Um, one of the things I did wanna mention is that here locally, um, the Worcester County commissioners have supported even local code amendments and changes to make it a little bit easier for these businesses to diversify and to really expand their operations. So um, I think we're, we're working here locally with it. We're are also looking at some other things statewide. Um, I do serve on the Maryland Tourism Coalition Legislative Committee. And when this came up last year, I believe it was for Calvert, Calvert County. I said, why isn't Worcester County on this list? So um, we respectfully ask that you support this bill with us. Um, and we look forward to inviting you to you know, visit some of these great places once they're able to really add um, a lot more experience and enjoy the open farms here in Worcester County. So we respectfully, respectfully request a favorable report for SB 32. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Purcell. Um, any committee member have a question on Senate Bill 32 on agritourism? Um, there is no opposition. Uh, seeing no questions, that concludes the hearing on Senator Croes' Bill 032. Thank you all for testifying um, and coming that long distance <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, turn it over to the vice chair. Next bill we're taking up is 067, Animal Welfare, Declawing Cats, Prohibited Acts. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. And uh, I am hoping that this, that uh, the, very the very many people who are going to be very passionate about this are going to not have us here all afternoon, but I assure you there is a lot of passion about this bill. Colleagues, for the record, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very be proud to be your vice chair, to be the senator representing Gaithersburg and Rockville. Uh, there are issues, in my opinion, that we feel like we know a lot about when they come before us. There are issues that we know very little or nothing about when they come before us. And so we listen to learn. And then there are issues that we think we know something about, but there's actually surprises. And for me, this bill fits into that category. For years, I'd heard about declawing cats and I just thought it was that. I never gave it much thought. I've never declawed any of my little kitties, um, but I think it's, um, I think it has been an extraordinary and inhumane process that I have learned a lot about. And so I'm gonna to try to offer um, a trajectory of what I've learned. And then there are people who are experts on this issue. Um, Lamoria, we do have a brief PowerPoint that I wanna share with you. If you could pull that up, that would be great. Sure, give me one second. Thank you. So while she's pulling this up, I will tell you that this is not a new concept, not new legislation. It has been passed around the country and significantly in many, many other countries around the world. And that is because of the horrible pain uh, and long-term implications that it has on our kitties. So you can uh, move it forward and you can move it past that one. So I adopted a Corona kitty and you can tell by the really long hair that the salon was closed during COVID. And, uh, and so I'm doing this in memory of my little kitty. You can go ahead. So, um, so a lot of people are worried about cats that scratch. And goodness knows, I, have, I had a scratching cat sometimes. Uh, that is sometimes how they engage. It's how they climb. It's how they defend themselves. Um, and certainly... Uh, we all get manicures, we all need to clip our own nails, and that's what we should be doing with our cats. If that doesn't seem to do the job, there are, um, there are little devices, little rubber pads that you can put on their nails, and this one has a very pretty manicure here for this kitty. Go ahead. So what declawing is, and I'm going to call it denuckling, because it is not just about the um, the nail itself, it actually takes not just the nail, but the nail bed and part of the bone and cuts it off. It's done in two ways. It's either done 
through clipping it off um, or through laser. And both ways have long-term implications. If you see on this slide, you see where the, where the nail is, but you see how much further down those red lines are. And the red lines indicate where the bone is cut. Thank you, Lamaria. Next. So you see above on this slide is a cat that just has normal claws uh, and those could probably use some trimming so that the uh, anyone who is playing with him uh, or her doesn't get scratched. But this is what happens afterwards. If you look below, and I should have warned you that this is kind of gruesome and I left off the worst of what was uh, shared with me and what we've researched. But you can see that in addition to the claw that truly a part of the nail bed and the bone is removed. What happens is that leaves a, a cavity there and that makes it very painful for them to walk to use their litter box or to um, or to just be happy little little campers here. Next one, Lamaria. <clears throat> so um, that's it. We can uh, we can stop sharing now. So I just want to mention. So what happens when the cats are, uh, claws are gone and they can't protect themselves anymore? They tend to be more likely to bite. Uh, which can be more dangerous for their family members or, or friends um, because there can be more uh, germs and stuff in their bite than a scratch can be. Um, the, uh, the videos that I've seen, and I see that Dr. Conrad is here, uh, this is uh, truly worth watching called The Paw Project about the terrible inhumanity as to what's done and the implication about this mm -hmm. surgery and what she does so effectively. And uh, someone on my staff went down to the cigar shop on Main Street because I thought this was very effective. So again, when we think about a manicure, we're just sort of trimming the nails. What this does is you basically are putting part of the paw into, uh, into this and then snapping it closed to remove it. And so you're actually removing the first, the equivalent of the first knuckle on my finger. And they do that each time. And whether it's cutting or using laser, it has the terrible, the same terrible implications. And this is pretty ferocious stuff. Now we're gonna be hearing from veterinarians and I respect that they are professionals and small businesses who uh, spend a lot of time studying, but they have an economic interest in the continuation of this brutal and inhumane practice. Uh, it has been outlawed um, uh, in so many places and the list is right here for me, uh, but I know the others, but it was Sweden and Norway and, and uh, England and, and, uh, and so many places and Pittsburgh and uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco and, and others, I'm not finding it on my notes, uh, but, um, but truly it is, uh, it is a problem and they don't do it on dogs. There is no other animal that does this. We would certainly never do it on people. And what happens is after the cats are in pain and therefore stop using the litter box because it's so painful for them to have the litter in there, uh, get up into those cavities, they start using the, the sofa or the rug to instead of a litter box. And a lot of times between that and new found biting, the cat moms and dads decide that they really can't handle this pet anymore. And they bring them back to the shelter where they are put down. It's tragic. It is not the way we should be treating our, our furry loved ones. Mm -hmm. And so there is a lot more to say, um, but I have wonderful experts here. Um, the first witness uh, was supposed to be Jennifer Bevan Dangle uh, from the Humane Society, Dr. Jen. Jennifer Conrad, I know you are at the clinic now. I don't know whether there's any wisdom to trying to switch, but thank you for being here. And Lisa Radoff uh, will wrap up my three witnesses. So um, Dr. Conrad, Jennifer Bevendangle, what's your, what's your pleasure? Uh, okay, either way. Okay, okay. Then Jennifer Bevendangle, you are my lead witness. You may begin, you have up to five minutes. Thank you so much, Senator. And out of respect for the committee, I certainly will not use my full time. You, you have a long hearing today and, and we have a lot of very eloquent witnesses. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Bevan Dangle. I'm the State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. Senator Kagan has done an incredible job explaining this procedure, why it is uh, an issue that merits your attention and the importance of this legislation. So I will not you know, even try to reiterate the excellent talking points she's already stated. I do want to draw the committee's attention to the written support that we have from several veterinarians um, out of respect for your time. They submitted written, um, they're not speaking in person today, but we have written testimony before you from Dr. Dodman, who is a practicing vet and a professor at Tufts, Dr. Cohn, who is a veterinarian here in Laurel, and the Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association, which is an entity representing practicing veterinarians from across the state. We appreciate that the opposition you'll hear later, many of the veterinarians will speak to different standards that they hold themselves to when they determine how and why to practice these operations. But it is very important to keep in mind that there is no statewide standard. There is no guarantee that any vet is upholding any of the standards that they'll speak to just voluntarily when they make these decisions. And you'll hear testimony later about a very simple call, phone call survey that was done that found that vet offices across the state are offering these procedures and they are doing them for reasons, including protecting furniture, issues that are far below the level of a true need to amputate a cat's toes. It's also incredibly important to keep in mind as we go through this hearing that regardless of whether you apply standards or not to the surgery, denuckling cats is a significant surgical intervention. It's a permanent amputation of the cat's toes, and it is being done to remedy a behavioral concern. It is not unprecedented for this legislative body, for this committee, to intervene with legislation when the level of medical intervention that is being used is so disproportionate to the behavioral issue that it is intended to address. Here we have a very significant surgery that is being used in the place of something as simple as what the Senator showed, those little nail caps that could be applied to the cat's claws and protect the human, protect the furniture, but also protect the cats. And you will hear from a human doctor on the fact that we simply do not condone major medical interventions for behavioral modification. It is not an area that is supported by best practice, and it is an area that we have legislative history where it is something that merits your attention and your action. It's also very important to understand the level of opposition from within the veterinary community to this practice. Groups such as the American Association of Feline Practitioners, the VCA Veterinary Clinics, Banfield Pet Hospitals have all banned beak clawing because they do agree that it is an egregiously barbaric practice no matter how it is performed. So the level of veterinary opposition to this practice certainly merits the attention of this committee, the action of this committee in determining whether this is a practice that Maryland should continue to condone and allow or whether we should grow the international and local tide of stopping this practice and protecting our companion animals. With that, I'll turn it over to the rest of the panel. We do urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 67. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bevan Dangle. Dr. Conrad, very nice to have you here. Thank you very much for stepping away from the clinic. You may begin, you have up to two and a half minutes. Thank you so much, um, Chair, uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Conrad, I'm a veterinarian and I am not an expert in anything except for declawing. I have been working on declawing for the last 20 years. I have to tell you that there is no good reason to declaw a cat. It's not good for the cat. It's, it makes a cat suffer uh, 10 or more amputations that are totally unnecessary. It's not good for the owner because they're going to break the human animal bond because the cat is going to come home from the litter, from the surgery, go to use the litter box, say this hurts and say, I'm never using it again. Then they also are going to be relegated to having to bite in order to protect themselves. And it's not, not good for veterinarians because we take an oath above all do no harm. How can this not be harmful, 10 unnecessary amputations. It's not good for the community because declawed cats lose their homes. They, they are, if someone was intolerant of the cat scratching the couch, they're really intolerant of the cat peeing on the couch 
or biting. So now that cat is going to lose its home. So I, I urge you to, uh, for a favorable uh, report, you're going to hear that declawing is rare from the opposition. It's not. It's done on 20 to 25 percent of American cats. Uh, that in the literature. You're going to hear that they want to protect human health. Well, if you're protecting human health, don't declaw the cat because the cat is going to bite. And they're going to, you're going to hear that I'd rather have a cat lose its toes than um, lose its life. Well, guess what? They lose their toes and then they lose their lives. That's what happens. Please, please, I urge you for a favorable uh, report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Conrad. Lisa Radoff. Um, Vice Chairman Kagan, Chairman Pinsky, members of the Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. My name is Lisa Radov. I'm the President and Chairman of Maryland Votes for Animals here in strong support of SB 67. You've already heard um, about declawing and had an excellent example and pictures from Senator Kagan. You've heard from my colleagues and you will hear much more compelling testimony. I just wanna make a few points. Sadly, here in Maryland, we have seen that this procedure is being done for non-medical reasons. During the summer of 2021, the Humane Society of the United States intern for Maryland selected veterinary hospitals from every county in the state. I've included the full survey in my written comments, but wanted to share a few highlights. 30 practices responded, representing counties across the state. 40% of the practices surveyed still perform declaw and for non-medical reasons. There is no geographic correlation to whether a practice offers this surgery or not. Of those practices that still perform declaw procedures, nearly 70% provided to protect household items such as the furniture or carpet. From this informal study, we see that the practice of declawing cats is happening in Maryland it's happening for non-medical reasons, and it's across the state. Our cats depend on us to care for them and to protect them from harm. We should not be subjecting cats to a surgical procedure as a means to curb a behavior. As a mother of four, I remember childproofing my house. There's no reason we can't do the same for our pets. There are far more humane, inexpensive, and effective ways to top, stop our cats from scratching the furniture. Declawing is not simply a cat manicure. In closing, I would like to thank Vice Chairman Kagan for her sponsorship of SB 67 and ask this committee for a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa Radoff, um, Maryland Votes for Animals. We have a lot of witnesses. I have already asked that my, and this is my bill, so I just wanna just remind you all that um, we love the passion, but let's try not to have everyone take the maximum two and a half minutes, but please, please, please make your points and make them uh, succinctly. Danielle, uh, Danielle Bays, Humane Society of the United States is next for up to two and a half minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Danielle Bays and I'm the Senior Analyst for Cat Protection and Policy at the Humane Society of the United States. I ask for your support of SB 67. Decline has serious implications for feeling welfare and the bond between people and their cats. If passed, Maryland would join a rapidly growing number of communities taking a stand against this inhumane practice. Convenience declawing of cats is already illegal in New York State and a growing number of cities across the country, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, six other California cities, Denver, St. Louis, Austin, Pittsburgh, and Madison. Eight out of 10 Canadian provinces prohibit non-therapeutic decline. It's banned or considered an unethical veterinary practice in a vast number of countries from New Zealand to Brazil to the United Kingdom and the EU. The European Convention on the Protection of Pet Animals prohibits the procedure. And while the U.S. veterinary community is increasingly opposed to decline, we can't continue to wait for the profession to end decline on its own. These amputations are still too commonly practiced, and cat owners are often not made aware of the high risk of permanent negative effects on the cats or of the procedure's controversies. There's also a false narrative out there uh, that without the option to declaw, cat owners would relinquish their pet animals to shelter, thus putting those cats at a risk of euthanasia. A study published just last year examined data from three years prior and three years after a province-wide declaw ban in British Columbia and found no difference in the number of cats surrendered to the shelter, including those surrendered specifically for destructive scratching, and no increase in the number of cats euthanized. Los Angeles and other cities that have banned declines share similar findings. The fact is that declining is no good for cats or for people. 
On behalf of our members and supporters in Maryland, the Humane Society of the United States asks for your support of SB 67, a humane bill which will protect the health and well being of family pets. Thank you, Ms. Bays. Next is Laura Cassidy from Positive Vibes Cat Behavior and Training, LLC in Baltimore. Welcome, Ms. Cassidy. Hi, thank you. Um, so I um, obviously urge a favorable report um, for HB 67, or SB 67. Um, I'm just speaking um, on behalf of, you know, I'm a certified cat behavior consultant practicing here in Baltimore. Um, I work with cats with behavior problems. I've worked uh, throughout rescue and shelter environments as well as with private owners. And I do have a lot of experience working with declawed cats who have major behavior problems, sometimes unresolvable behavior problems um, due to being declawed. Um, a lot of the arguments the opposition will make is that declawing keeps your cat in homes. Um, there is research, um, there is a statistic out there that says that of the cats surrendered to shelters for behavioral issues, about 70% of those cats are declawed. Um, I've seen firsthand um, that declawed cats are more likely to bite, especially when they're placed in a shelter environment and they are put in a cage and they have no other way to escape or defend themselves other than to bite. Um, and I have seen that specific phenomenon cause these cats to be euthanized. We are clogging up our shelters. We are causing our taxpayers unnecessary money um, by continuing to allow this practice. Um, there are no declawed cats surrendered to shelters for re reasons other than behavioral reasons. Um, it's extremely common um, and not all of those cats are rehabilitatable with the limited resources that our shelters have here in the state of Maryland, especially our government run municipal shelters. So I just wanna take this time to urge a favorable report on this bill. Um, thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Ms. Cassidy. Thank you for the work that you do and thank you for your testimony. Next up is Amit Shah. Um, thank yes. you, Senator. <clears throat> thank you. Um, hi, my name is Amish Shah, MD. Uh, thank you, Senator Kagan. I'm an emergency physician, as well as a Democratic member of the Arizona House of Representatives. Uh, I attended Northwestern University Medical School in Chicago and was a faculty member at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine uh, in Manhattan, teaching residents and medical students for quite some time. I'm testifying in support of SB 67. I became interested in this issue after reading about it in other jurisdictions and wanted to introduce a bill myself, which I have done with Republican and Democratic co-sponsors over the last three years in Arizona. Um, the practice is widely condemned as cruelty and mutilation and is now illegal in, in a lot of countries uh, all over the world. Um, my, my colleagues have gone over some of the anatomy. Yes, they cut off the, the distal phalanx, which is like the end of your finger, and no veterinarian, per the research we've seen, can guarantee with certainty that the procedure will not lead to chronic pains or problems in any one particular cat. Um, <clears throat> Um, but the opponents of this bill have asserted that sometimes it may have a benefit to human health. And this is why, as a human physician, I am here to talk to you. As a practicing emergency physician of 15 years continuously, I am emphatically and categorically asserting that all of the claims these folks are making about human health are false. So they do not practice human medicine. I do, and I've been doing it for a while, and I've never seen a person seriously harmed by cat scratches in the emergency department. I've never seen a hemophiliac or anticoagulated person require blood or factor from scratches. I've never seen someone who is immunocompromised suffer a serious infection from it. And the CDC and the NIH have found no systematic evidence of harm. Um, we have watched in the, the Maryland House hearing on an identical bill, making opponents making claims about these concerns, though they do not have training in human medicine, and, and we do. Uh, the scientific literature, I said, bears this out. As they said, the bite wounds are much worse. And as any emergency physician will tell you, the bite wound is a serious problem, often leading to tenosynovitis of the hand or other uh, more serious bacterial infections in a human. Furthermore, as a former medical school faculty member, I will tell you a key concept in our medical ethics is beneficence, that we have erred in the past by doing things like 
throwing unnecessary antibiotics at children or lobotomies for psychiatric patients. We learned, we, we learned over time that the uh, beneficence for people means that, that, that our patients means that we do good for them. And we think about them rather than what is convenient for a caregiver or someone else other than the patient. And the practice of declawing violates that, that principle. I know at least one Senator here has medical school training from what I understand and, and was a professor. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and like I said, we, we sponsored a bill with Republicans and Democrats. Even this year, I have a bill up that is co-sponsored by both parties. And we had a stakeholder meeting and these claims were examined in detail and fell apart um, with very okay. minimal scrutiny. Mr. scrutiny. Shaw. Oh, thank, thank you, you for your time. I appreciate it. So uh, and, and I'm sorry for going over. I, I uh, know how it goes. <laughs> We appreciate both your healthcare expertise and your understanding of the legislative process. So thank you on your service and your, for your service and your expertise on both. We have one more witness uh, that's favorable and that is Carol Oliver. Is Ms. Oliver is here? Yes, you are. You have up to two and a half minutes. Yes. Oliver. Welcome. Thank you. Chair Pensky, Vice Chair Kagan and members of the committee. My name is Carol Oliver and I live in Tacoma Park, Maryland. I volunteer for the Feline Rescue Association, and we are in support of SB 67. Our mission is to bring better lives to stray, abandoned, and feral cats through rescue, adoption, spay, neuter, and education. While I can tell you a lot of sad stories about declawed cats and kittens, I have a very personal experience to share. My cat, Shadow. When she was eight or nine years old, her owners decided to declaw her and then surrendered her to her shelter because her litter box habits and her behavior were unacceptable to them. When I first met Shadow at the shelter, she was hiding under a blanket in her cage, unfamiliar surroundings scaring her, but it was obvious she, she craved that human attention. She was sweet and loving. Knowing that her chances of adoption were slim, I decided to make her a part of my family. When I got her home, I realized how mangled and tender her poor paws were. After a few years, she finally stopped flinching when you touch her, her paws. It probably took four years to actually heal, but the consequences of being mutilated lasted a lifetime. She never used a litter box. She walked with the posture of a raccoon. She had arthritis so bad it was just horrible. Uh, she loved to cuddle with the other kitties, but she never participated in playtime. Cats have this instinct to scratch to shed that outer layer of nail. Declawed cats still have that instinct, but it is very painful. And I know that because I've witnessed it. I loved this cat and I was happy to have her for 10 years. And she was lucky she found some place that understood her disabilities. And unfortunately there is no happy ending for so many declawed cats. And I must say in all these years of fostering, I fostered over 400 cats and catching feral cats on the streets of Baltimore to get them vetted. I have been scratched countless times. The only time I ever need medical attention was from a cat bite. In recent years, Maryland has shown great compassion in protecting dogs. And we ask that Maryland strike another blow against animal cruelty. Please pass this decline bill. Shelters, rescues, and cats will thank you for it. We, are, we urge a favorable report on SB 67. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. You are exactly on time and we appreciate your testimony and the work you do in fostering so many felines. Uh, before we go to the opposition, are there any questions for the proponents? Uh, Senator Hester. Thank you. I had too many windows open. Um, <laughs> thank you for your leadership on this bill, Senator Kagan. Um, I was just curious, if, first of all, is there any way to enforce this built into the legislation? And um, secondly, is there any reason why this might be required for a health reason? So um, let's see, I will toss it to the experts. Dr. Conrad, do you wanna start with the health uh, ex uh, exceptions? And then Jennifer Bevan Dangle, if you want to speak briefly to the uh, enforcement and how it's been done elsewhere, if that makes sense. Dr. Conrad? Yes, thank you again for having me. Um, so the, um, the, there is an exemption in, written in the bill that if the cat had something like a tumor in the toe, then of course you could take 
take it off, but that's not declawing. Declawing is a is a cosmetic procedure, so it's it's a surgical. You know, surgery should be for anatomical pathology, which is it, which is absolutely allowed in the bill. As far as human health, it does protect human health not to have cats biting them. And, and just to make sure that you understand the CDC, the NIH, U.S. Public Health Service, they all say that declawing is not advised. They actually do say it. Thank you, Dr. Connor. Ms. Jennifer Bevan Dengel, do you want to answer this second half of the, the other half of the question? Certainly. The legislation treats as much like it does most of our other cruelty against animal statutes where enforcement ultimately rests with animal control officers or the state or local law enforcement that would handle any other type of animal cruelty complaints. Inevitably, most of these laws end up being complaint driven. Uh, someone would have a, a situation where maybe a vet you know, did declaw their cat and that would get reported. So it's not that any of our cruelty well, laws are very proactive right. with, with enforcement coming in. It's usually complaint driven. Okay, so we lost we lost a little bit of that, but uh, Senator Hester, you got the, the gist of it, that complaint driven and then enforcement from there, enforcing the law as we would in a lot of other laws. Does that Thank you, suffice, Senator. Senator Hester? Okay, we're gonna move on seeing no other questions from colleagues. Uh, we're gonna move to the opponents. First up is Moira Cyphers, Compass Government on behalf, uh, Compass Government Relations on behalf of MDVMA. And I know she'll tell us what that is, but that, that those are the vets. Uh, welcome Ms. Cyphers. Good afternoon. And thank you very much, Vice Chair Kagan and um, members of the committee. This is Moira Cyphers. I'm here on behalf of my clients, uh, the Maryland Veterinary Medical Association, MDVMA. Um, in the last, I think, fair to say decade plus in Maryland, um, declawing has really become a procedure of last resort. So when a veterinarian has tried alternative solutions, thoroughly counseled their patients, um, and the only cases we're aware of is when a sick person is faced with surrendering their cat. Um, and, you know, veterinarians, they start their career by taking an oath to protect animal and public health. And the truth is that some cats may be better off home post-surgery than facing a 50% chance of death in a shelter. Um, but that judgment call really relies on and rests with the experience and training of the veterinarian. And I, you know, I do wanna push back. I heard some stats. There's very easily searchable publicly available data. There's, uh, I think, 4,700 cats available for adoption in Maryland and quick back of the envelope math, but less than 1%, I think it's 0.4% of them, 21 out of almost 5,000 are declawed. So talking about, well, a quarter of cats in America, a quarter of cats in Maryland are not declawed. Um, this is not quite the, the emergent or urgent um, abuse against cats that I, I think we heard a little bit. Um, from the proponents. So there are myriad ways to discourage declawing and at the same time ensure that experienced regulated licensed veterinarians do retain their clinical authority and judgment. Um, 2020, earlier this fall, you know, we provided a number of amendments which have never been accepted by the proponents, but we can insert language to prevent euthanasia and ensure that declaw is truly the last procedure of resort. Um, more effectively discourages the practice. There's a new national AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association, proof standards, put that in the Veterinary Practice Act and require CEUs so that all veterinarians are making sure that you know we're putting these standards into practice. There's accountability with the state board. Um, and then I do, I think on behalf of the client, have to just absolutely disagree with the characterization that this is a money driver or it's easy first, to obtain. I'm afraid some of the other some of the other witnesses may have to pick up on some of your arguments. If you okay, could, all yeah. right, I will wrap it up. I think you know, MDVMA coming in opposed. Happy to work with you, you. Um, Madam Vice Chair. But I think there's a reason why in the last five or six years only one one state has passed this ban, Thank and you. it's because you know. Okay substitute veterinarians. Thank okay. you. Um, there's a colleague of yours, Josh Howe, also with Compass Government Relations, who was also going to testify if Mr. Howe is here. And then He's I'm going to 
He's not going to testify. Okay. Um, so the next witness would be Marissa Francis with the Maryland Veterinary Medical Association. Is she here? Okay. Um, Ms. Francis, I'm going to toss it to you. I'm also going to toss this back to the chairman because I have a bill hearing in another committee in a moment and I'm about to be summoned. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. The red folder is on its way. Uh, welcome, Ms. Francis. Thank you. Thank you, Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Marissa Francis. I'm the executive director of the Maryland Veterinary and Medical Association. And established in 1886, MDVMA is a community of veterinary professionals who are passionate about veterinary medicine and improving the lives of those it touches. Over 2,100 licensed veterinarians practice and reside in the state of Maryland. 33% of them are members of MDVMA. 93% of them are members of our national organization. Okay, no Maryland's veterinarians wholeheartedly believe that the AVMA's policy on declawing domestic is the correct approach. Their policy was revised in 2020, and the AVMA and it states that they discourage declawing as an elective procedure, encourages non-surgical alternatives, and it also states that veterinarians must counsel cat owners about the details of the procedure itself, potential complications, alternatives to surgery natural scratching behavior, and finally, if in last resort cases, the declaw is performed, appropriate payment management must be utilized. One major issue between the MDVMA and the supporters of this bill is data. They've dealt in broad generalizations and have cited data from decades old studies suggesting that declawing is widespread and used as an economic driver for veterinarians, which is simply not true. Suggesting our shelters and rescue rescue groups are overwhelmed with declawed cats is also not true. A search on Pet Finder will confirm that less than 1% of adoptable cats in Maryland are actually declawed. What we do know is that over half of our licensed veterinarians do not perform this procedure at all. Those that do perform an average of one to three a year. We wouldn't be here today if we didn't believe that in the rarest of rare cases, declawing is preferable to the negative impacts of surrender. We must not forget the request of a declaw is by the pet owner, it's pet owner driven. It is vital to educate Maryland's pet owners and provide them with facts about the clawing and it is clear more needs to be done. Maryland's veterinarians are trained clinicians who educate their clients every single day and should retain the right to make these judgment calls rather than have that right legislated away. For this reason, MDVMA respectfully opposes this bill. Thank you, uh, Ms. Francis, uh, Dr. Weeman. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Matthew Weeman, Legislative Committee Chair for the Maryland Veterinary Medical Association and practicing veterinarian on the Eastern Shore. I'm here in opposition to SB 67. However, I want to be very clear to this committee and to the people on social media flooding our professional pages with threats and vitriol that MDVMA's position is not one of supporting declaws. We don't support declawing. We oppose the language of this proposed legislation. Declawing cats is and, sh and should be discouraged and must remain a procedure of last resort because some owners in consult with their physicians, not necessarily the physician here today, deem it medically necessary. Without this option, we're sending vulnerable cats to shelters where there is still considerable likelihood they'll be euthanized. We oppose this bill because it takes away veterinarian discretion. We're governed by our state licensing board, which does set the minimum standard of care for all of us. They ensure our practices are appropriately regulated and they hold our veterinarians accountable. This bill prohibits veterinarians from making clinical decisions on behalf of their patients and it undermines the veterinary client patient relationship. The American Veterinary Medical Association has already set the surgical standards and necessary constraints to discourage declaws. Respectfully, I must take issue with the facts and figures presented by the proponents. Very few declaws are performed in this state. We know that to be true. Of the approximately 6,000 cats that I see available for adoption on Pet Finder within 100 miles of Baltimore, only 33 are declawed. I've not declawed a cat in years, and I've lost more money just testifying on this legislation today than I have ever or will ever make declawing cats. I'm not here for any financial interest. If protection of cats was the primary objective of the proponents, then any of the six or more amendments we've proposed over the years to further discourage declawing cats 
would have been accepted. The proponents wish for you to believe they want a ban of a specific elective painful surgery that a cat can't consent to. And there is no surgery a cat can consent to. The most common example of a painful surgery that a cat can't consent to, which is typically performed for a non-therapeutic purpose, is a surgical sterilization. The wording of this legislation obstructs veterinarians from fulfilling our oath to protect animal health, welfare, and the prevention of suffering. And I urge each of you to see this proposed legislation for exactly what it is and issue an unfavorable report. Thank you, uh, Dr. Weeman. Uh, how about uh, Dr. Jane Brunt? Thank you, Chairman Prinsky and Vice Chair Kagan, uh, members of this very important committee, at least to me. My name is Dr. Jane Brunt. I um, started and own the cat hospital at Towson on York Road in Baltimore County. I've been a feline veterinarian for more than 30 years and only a feline veterinarian. I have clients from 25 of our state's legislative districts. I don't declaw cats and haven't in more than 10 years. Uh, that's over a decade of choosing not to declaw cats. So it might seem in Congress that I'm in here to oppose Senate Bill 67. And along with the American Veterinary Medical Association and the Maryland Veterinary Medical Association, as this bill is presented, we oppose it. Honestly, I do agree with the bill proponents on some key points. The first is that cats deserve to have their claws. Scat scratching things is normal behavior. Uh, they mark their territory, they exercise, it's for claw care. And for those reasons, appropriate education and resources to express that normal behavior must be provided. And when that happens, the case for couches is obsolete. I also agree with the proponents that it's unfortunate that on rare occasions, complications have occurred. And our profession is capable and qualified to prevent and police that when it happens, if it happens. But in my mind, what's even more unfortunate is that those rarities have been mischaracterized and overstated by the bill proponents. The plural of anecdote is not data. It's important to be accurate and it's been disheartening for me to see, read and hear the misinformation, misinterpretation of published studies and misstatements of organization stances that I even heard today. Proponents have claimed that non-therapeutic decline is of no benefit to the cat. And from purely a physical perspective, I do agree with that. But when cats are denied, their familiar places and the people that they know, they experience fear, anxiety, and stress, and subsequent illnesses affecting other physiologic systems occur. I can send that citation, Stella et al. As this bill is presented, we oppose it. And finally, as a licensed practicing veterinarian in Maryland, even though I don't declaw, I'm here to support my veterinary colleagues' professional judgment to act in the best interest of the cat. I urge this committee to review the data, consider the sources, and cast an unfavorable vote on Senate Bill 67. Thank you for your time. Okay, I believe that uh, completes the those unfavorable. Uh, are there any questions for any of the last three or four witnesses? Seeing none, uh, that concludes then um, Senator Kagan's bill 067. Thank all of you for uh, the patience and uh, for your testifying. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna go on to 086, Senator Hester, Department of Natural Resources, Lease Agreements, Trail Access Provisions. Um, Senator Hester will be followed by Kimberly Egan, um, Dave McGill and Jennifer Webster. There is no opposition, so just keep that in mind. Um, Senator Hester, and again, having no opposition doesn't mean there might not be opposition later, but I just like to illuminate that point. Uh, Senator Hester, uh, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Vice Chair Kagan and members of the Education, Health and Environment Committee uh, for your consideration of Senate Bill 86, which will require tenants at least property from the Department of Natural Resources 
to main, maintain unobstructed access to trails. As we heard earlier today in the hearing um, on national parks, now more than ever, the public wants to use uh, these wonderful uh, state resources that we have. And however, currently, DNR land tenants are not required to allow access to public trails that cross their leased property. Across the states, tenants have placed fences, barbed wire, and abandoned or rusty machinery on trailheads. And these actions are in direct conflict with the fundamental principle of the park system's mission statement to encourage the use and enjoyment of nature by Marylanders. Specifically, the difficulty accessing public trails that cross leased property presents a health and safety issue. Bikers, horseback riders, or joggers may be discouraged from utilizing trails that should be available to them and may injure themselves trying to get around these current obstructions. In this situation, the obstructions also prevent first responders from reaching trail users who require immediate medical attention. Luckily, there is a simple common sense solution. SB 86 will require that a single clause be added to DNR leases, such that the tenants must leave an unobstructed border around trailheads on their property. This will ensure that trail users and first responders can utilize the trails as the state intends. It would also require the department to submit a report of all executed leases to DGS to verify that the clause has been included. Hiking and other activities allowed by the trail system allow an affordable and healthy form of recreation that should be accessible to all, but you have to be able to access the parks. To best ensure the accessibility and safety of trails in Maryland, I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 86. Thank you, Senator uh, Hester. Uh, let's go to uh, Kimberly Egan with the Maryland Horse Council. Thank you, Senator Pinsky, and thank you, Senator Kagan and the committee and Senator Hester. My name is Kim Egan. I'm the president of the Maryland Horse Council. I'm going to be brief and not take my whole time. We are the trade association for the entire Maryland horse industry, and we represent over 40,000 Marylands who either make their living with horses or enjoy them. <clears throat> Most riders are trail riders, and the trail riding industry in Maryland generated $424 million of economic impact to Maryland for 2022. <clears throat> Those are inflation adjusted numbers provided by the American Horse Council. At bottom, we see this as a public safety issue. Because more people are using the parks in Maryland because of the pandemic and because the state is investing in our outdoor recreation and the Glendening Commission is looking at equity issues, equity and access issues, um, we feel it, it's, it's critically important that people using the Maryland public trails um, are safe in doing so. New users especially need to be assured that they are safe. Many parks, especially the ones in the more rural areas that are surrounded by either farms um, or by old historic homes that are leased to tenants that are DNR owned, um, obstruct access to trails. We understand that not always are these trails official DNR trails. I understand that DNR refers to them on occasion as social trails, but Social trails are used just as frequently as the official marked trails and injuries happen on social trails just as much as they do on officially marked trails and first responders need to be able to get to the closest trail to the injured person, which is often a social trail. <clears throat> In my written testimony, we have <coughs> a number of situations that have been that have been safety problems that have an, at times been severe requiring helicopter, uh, medevacs, et cetera, where access to the injured person was obstructed by conditions on public land leased to private individuals. We think that it is a reasonable expectation of people leasing public land to maintain access for public safety and for uh, recreational use. And we think that it is um, somewhat axiomatic that public lands are not public if the public cannot access them and that public lands are not safe if first responders cannot reach them. Uh, I know that there have been there's been written testimony submitted by other trail riding groups, um, at least two to my knowledge, and several individual trail riders. So I will not go into wrap it up, Miss Egan. Sorry. Could you wrap it up, please? Yes, that's what I was saying. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
Uh, let's go to uh, Dave McGill and then Jennifer Webster, and then we'll take questions. Mr. McGill. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Dave McGill. I'm the Maryland Advocacy Director for uh, MORE, Mid-Atlantic Off-Road Enthusiasts. We're an uh, 1,800-member mountain bike club. We do over 15,000 hours every year of trail maintenance um, on multi-use public trails. Um, many of them, we work in a dozen different um, state parks uh, run by the Department of Natural Resources. Um, I've been involved for over 30 years. Um, and so both for maintenance and for, and for cycling, um, we are aware that access to our trails is, is important. It's critical. You can't have a trail with a break in it. Um, and um, uh, DNR has worked often with landowners on an informal basis. That's often been successful or the lessees, but it hasn't always been. And so I think this idea of we've asked for many years that DNR put exactly this clause into their standard lease form. I'm not sure why they haven't done it. We're very glad to see that this will happen. I think it will simply make it safer and easier access for everybody. It's really not a burden on the landowners. It's a very, very small change in their lease rights. So please consider this favorably. Thank you, uh, Mr. McGill. Let's go to uh, Ms. Webster, please. Uh, is Ms. Webster with us? Sorry, now I'm here. Okay. <laughs> okay, hi, my name is Jennifer Webster and I'm, I represent um, the Maryland Association for Wildlife Conservation. Um, we are a group um, of uh, countryside sportsmen uh, who uh, pursue chasing sports and hunting uh, behind hounds, either on foot or on, on horseback. Um, because the open space in, in our state has um, you know, become less and less and um, more public parks are being util utilized for um, hunting and chasing, um, we depend quite a bit on, on the, the public land, uh, the DNR trails uh, for our, to continue um, pursuing our sport. And as the two before me have, have stated, um, it is paramount uh, for safety of all riders and um, chasers that first responders are able to access anyone who might be injured on the trails. Um, and you know, there have been instances where that has been a, a true impossibility because of crops grown right up to the, to the edge of the perimeter um, or equipment in the way and so forth. Um, so I don't wanna take up any more time just to um, ask that the committee please consider this uh, very simple, I, I believe, um, and logical change to this, uh, to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Ms. Webster. Questions for sponsor Senator Hester or any of the other advocates? Um, seeing no hands and there being no opposition, that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 086. Senator Hester, thank you on that bill. We will go to the next to last bill, uh, Senate Bill 121. This is again, Senator Hester, Maryland Farms and Family Fund, Maryland Food and Agricultural Resiliency Mechanism Grant Program, and Maryland Farm to School Meal Grant Program, Pilot Program, Alterations and Establishment. Um, we have Senator Hester, she will be followed by Adam LaRose, and then uh, Michael Wilson, and then Colby Ferguson. Then we will have five or six witnesses after that. I'm looking through the file. Again, there is no opposition. Uh, you do not have to use all of your two and a half minutes for people who are following Senator Hester. Uh, with that, we'll start uh, with Senator Hester, the sponsor of this bill. Please. Thank you, Chairman Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the EHE Committee uh, for your consideration of SB 121, the Farm to Food Security Act, which invests in three programs to enhance resiliency and reduce food insecurity in the state of Maryland. As was mentioned earlier, this committee voted unanimously to establish the Maryland Food Resiliency Council, which has been hard at work over the interim. And this bill builds on three of those recommendations. 
As the wealthiest state in our country, you may not expect nutrition to be an issue in Maryland. However, nearly one third of Marylanders are considered food insecure. Now there's no single cause of food insecurity, but the economic shocks of COVID-19 and the economic uh, fallout of that have, have exacerbated the structural challenges present in our food system. And since March of 2020, as an example, the Maryland Food Bank has reported an 88% increase in food distribution. Simultaneously, farmers and food-related businesses saw significant drops in demand and increased difficulty in distribution. The Farm to Food Security Act invests in three programs to enhance resiliency and reduce food insecurities. And I'll run you through all three briefly. First, the Maryland market money simply matches SNAP and WIC benefits that are used at Maryland farmers markets. This program reduces barriers to healthy foods, improves economic viability of Maryland's farmers, and diversifies the customer base of farmers markets. Since its inception in 2013, over $1 million of funding has been utilized to alleviate food insecurity. And this bill would increase the annual funding from $100,000 to $300,000 to increase its scope and impact. Secondly, the bill would create the Maryland Food and Agriculture Resilience Mechanism, MD Farm. This program is modeled after successful initiatives in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, New York, and Virginia, and would help to mitigate the economic hardships and supply chain issues of COVID-19. Specifically, it would create a new fund in the Department of Agriculture that would award up to $1.25 million of grants annually to food banks or charitable emergency food providers to assist in the procurement, process, transportation, and distribution of surplus, seasonal, or contractual food products to vulnerable Marylanders, while simultaneously supporting local farmers' revenue streams. Third, this bill would establish the Farm to School Pilot Grant Program, which is based on similar programs in Michigan, New York, and California. This would allow Maryland school districts to apply for grants equal to 20 cents for every meal served that includes Maryland-grown food. The current Farm to School initiatives in the in the in the Sorry, <laughs> I think I need glasses. Farm to, full, farm to school initiatives at the county level receive no state funding or staffing for this purpose. And this pilot would allocate a half a million dollars to expand access to local and healthy food for Maryland students. In your floor system, you'll find an amendment to page eight, which enables schools to apply for this grant at the start of the year by predicting their meal servings as opposed to waiting until the end of the year. And this amendment was also offered during the house hearing. The combined impact of the Farm to Food Security Act will increase the purchasing power, uh, uh, increase the purchasing power of food insecure Marylanders, increase revenue for farmers markets, and ensure our students' meals have a local Maryland food component. By voting for this bill, you can build a more sustainable local food system that fortifies supply chains, empowers local farmers, and brings equity to food access and consumption. For these reasons, I request a favorable report on Senate Bill 121. Thank you, uh, Senator Fry Hester. Uh, let's go to Adam LaRose from the Capital Area Food Bank, please. Mr. Rose, the Rose. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adam LaRose. I serve as the Director of Advocacy and Public Policy uh, here at the Capital Area Food Bank. We serve Maryland's two largest counties, Prince George's and Montgomery, and we work hand in hand with the Maryland Food Bank to ensure that nearly one in three food insecure residents throughout the state are able to access the nutritious food they need and deserve. The Capitary Food Bank has had to take unprecedented actions during this crisis. We had to lease two new warehouses, one of which in Hyattsville, to be able to store the amount of food needed for our clients and our partners. We needed that space to stockpile and navigate the ongoing market of supply chain delays and product shortages. When our donations plummeted by 75%, a source of inventory, mind you, that usually accounts for nearly two thirds of our food distribution, we had to purchase food in the open market. Since April of 2020, we have purchased more than 1,100 truckloads of food, more than four times than pre-COVID. What used to take us four to six days to order a truckload of canned tuna or produce can now take upwards of four to six weeks. And during the pandemic, we have provided 48 million meals to Maryland residents. This has been the most resource and labor intensive crisis we have ever navigated. Like that of the Great Recession, we anticipate this recovery will take years for our clients who are already dealing with a multitude of inequities. This legislation will create the Maryland Farm Program, as Senator Hester mentioned, modeled off of many successful other states. Maryland Farm would ensure Maryland sourced, born and bred products and services would be leveraged 
to alleviate hunger and build sustainable resiliency in our state. This legislation will expand the Maryland Market Money Program, so our clients can make their SNAP and WIC dollars go much further for their families. This legislation would allow any one of the 24 school districts to receive incentives to use Maryland source agricultural products right onto the plates of our school children. The pandemic exposed weaknesses in our food system that we must begin to address now to not only help with the recovery of this crisis, but to prepare for future ones. This legislation is a step in the right direction and we sincerely hope for your support. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. LaRose. Uh, let's go to Michael Wilson, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Michael J. Wilson. I am the director of Maryland Hunger Solutions, but I am uh, speaking to you today on behalf of the Maryland State Food Resilience Council. Um, we have submitted written testimony for your consideration. And so I will not read that statement. Uh, I will focus on just the three parts of the bill, which are uh, mentioned already um, by the previous speakers uh, for the Maryland um, farm to food, farm to food act. Um, it would let me find it out quickly. Focus on the um, the farm to school act, um, leveraging local surplus for um, charitable organizations, and would importantly um, increase the funding for the uh, Maryland Market Money Program which is how many um, low-income SNAP participants uh, participate at our local farmers markets. Um, we look forward to your support. Um, the Food Resilience Council is supportive of this legislation and I will yield back the rest of my time. Oh, one more thing. We also submitted uh, a written statement on behalf of Maryland Hunger Solutions in support of this as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Wilson. How about Mr. Ferguson, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau. We support uh, Senate Bill 121. We think this is a, uh, a good, uh, good move uh, to help try to get more farmers in Maryland to, to fit into this distribution network uh, that has really alienated the local, the local movement for years. Um, not, not everything is, is broken within this system. I think the poultry industry is, is uh, networked very well. Our dairy industry is doing good with uh, within the, um, the farm to school programs and things like that. But to say that the rest are, are good uh, would be an understatement uh, uh, that's that's definitely not there. So uh, what we see with this bill that, that, that's so, so so good is after watching how the CARES Act money was utilized from the at the federal level uh, and how those um, food box programs were created, uh, Virtually none of our farmers were able to pro to uh, participate in that program. It was um, it was for the very large uh, large producers that are not really for producers, but for the large distributors. And um, our local farmers weren't able to do it. Uh, this MD Farm program uh, puts that in place to allow our smaller and mid-sized farms to participate uh, to utilize uh, the local products in the state of Maryland. Uh, in addition, the, the, I, I really like the way that this uh, farm to school pilot program is put together, uh, and I think that's going to help. We've got farmers that are already working with, with schools, but they run out of money literally in September, October every time, and so they're not able to utilize that program all the way through the year. So we hope that th this bill will move forward. I think it's actually an outstanding bill, and we support Senate Bill 121. Thank, thank you, um, Mr. Ferguson. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Heather Halsey, followed by Ann Wallerstead. Hi, thank you, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Heather Halsey. I'm the Maryland Market Money Program Manager, and I represent my organization, the Southern Maryland Agricultural Development Commission, who is a division of the Tri-County Council for Southern Maryland. And I'm here asking for favorable support on SB 121. Um, I don't want to duplicate anything anybody else has said, and I know that... Um, Steve McHenry will touch on some things and he submits written testimony, but I wanted to touch on two specific things in regard to the Maryland Farms and Families Fund. And that's that this program work supported by the Farms and Families Fund takes a lot of administrative and operational work. 
along with training and technical assistance we provide for markets and farmers. A lot is involved that's necessary to get the vital additional funding from a very complex range of sources. And there's grant writing, extensive reporting to funders, and it would be really great to increase this funding in the future in order to allow and grow and meet the increased demand because public demand for this program grows exponentially every year. And on that note, and in my closing, last thing I'll have to say, because I know we're all, we've been here a while, um, I'd like to mention that many other states provide funding for this work. Um, DC, not a state, but also our neighbor, um, appropriated $1 million for their nutrition incentive program called Produce Plus for 2022. And then Oregon, a state with only two thirds of the population of Maryland, um, the Oregon legislature just allocated $4 million through 2023, which was a continuation from a previous $1.5 million bill. And while I understand Maryland isn't quite there yet on those type of numbers, other states clearly demonstrate the need that exists for this type of program to serve both the public and our agricultural producers. So in closing, I'd strongly encourage you to offer favorable support for SB 121. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um... Uh, Ms. Halsey, uh, Ms. Wallerstedt, are you with us? I am. Thank you, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committee. My name is Ann Wallerstedt. I'm the Senior Director of Government Relations for the Maryland Food Bank. And to complement what Mr. LaRose says, we work in tandem with the Capital Area <laughs> Food Bank. We serve the remaining 21 jurisdictions in Baltimore City. The number one goal of the food banks in Maryland is to reduce and eliminate food insecurity. And we really can't do that without the work of the involvement of partners, such as some of those outlined in this bill. Um, reaching food insecure populations and communities through the farmers markets and farm stands, different schools, and then our traditional food banking partners, such as farms and other community organizations um, is really imperative to increase the reach that we have across the state in reaching some of these um, food insecure communities, especially those who lack consistent access to this healthy food and produce, such as those areas traditionally known as food deserts. Um, you have my written testimony, so I won't repeat too much here, but, but I do want to say for food assistance organizations like the Maryland Food Bank, it's really important for us to be able to expand in, in some of the ways Mr. Ferguson touched on as well. Um, we want to be supporting and growing some of these more diverse farms um, to really strengthen our overall food system. Um, I've provided some of those examples in my written testimony, so I won't touch on those, um, but we really, we're really supportive of that effort. And then the other part of the bill that I really wanna highlight is in the MD farm section, and that's providing funding for additional processing costs for these food assistance organizations. Um, that's really gonna allow us to continue to serve Maryland grown produce of two food insecure communities across the state outside of that traditional growing season. So we think that part of the bill in particular is going to be very helpful for food assistance organizations. Um, so in closing, we really appreciate the bill sponsor for introducing this bill and her overall dedication to the cause of food insecurity. And we ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go to uh, Aisha Holmes to be followed by Steve McHenry. Stephen Mandel and Amanda Beth Brewster. Ms. Holmes. Thank you, Chairman Pinsky. It's, it's an honor to be here today with the committee. I am with No Kid Hungry of Maryland. No Kid Hungry is a national organization that is working hard to end hunger for children across this, across this country. We at No Kid Hungry Maryland strongly support SB 121. One out of every six children in Maryland right now is growing up in a family that is struggling with hunger. The access to meals is essential to ensuring that children are able to eat nutritiously every day. This legislation will increase access to locally sourced foods for school, school meals that children can enjoy. Nationally, No Kid Hungry has worked with many states to build a farm to school program similar to what Maryland is doing. However, I have to say in reading this bill, this bill particularly has taken the best practices and lessons learned across the country to create a model that will work effectively when it's implemented in Maryland, I hope. The 20 cent per meal um, incentive is both generous but also competitive. It will allow for the participation of, of schools it will allow schools to participate and incorporate fresh and locally grown fruits and vegetables into those school meals. And I feel like this is absolutely a win-win for Maryland. As you know, the school systems have been very hard hit in this pandemic. 
Because of ongoing issues related to supply chain and other barriers, the food and nutrition departments have truly struggled over the past two years. I believe that the Farm to School grant and other aspects of this legislation will build the resiliency and allow for much more consistent supply to ensure healthy meals for Maryland's children. I'm gonna wrap it up. Everything else is in my written testimony and thank you for your time and thank you, Senator Hester, for allowing us to be here today. Thank you, Ms. Holmes. Um, let's go to Mr. McHenry. Welcome back, Steve. It's been a while. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Great to be back before the committee of this session. Uh, Steve McHenry representing the Maryland Agricultural and Resource-Based Industries Development Corporation, much better known by the acronym MARBIDCO. And you have my written testimony, so you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to read it. Um, we're here specifically to support the Maryland uh, Farms and Families Fund component of this legislation, which is a grant program administered by the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Marbitco has been a recipient of that grant for the last two years to help run the Maryland Market Money Program. The, the backstory on that is the prior uh, operator of that program, a nonprofit that um, unfortunately went out of business, we partnered with the Southern Maryland Ag Development Commission to save that program not quite two years ago. And we've been administering that program since, uh, again, with our friends at Svetic, and you already heard from Ms. Halsey. Um, current law provides $100,000. This bill increases that grant to $300,000. And this funding is foundational for our efforts to raise other monies from philanthropic organizations, USDA, and county governments. We're, we're partnering with uh, uh, three county governments currently, and we, we uh, greatly appreciate their support, and it expands the the reach of the program to provide more incentive funding at the farmer's markets. Um, the bill does uh, a couple of other things. It changes the distribution of uh, eligibility for us to be able to use a little more of the MDA grant to then access and leverage resources, particularly, as I mentioned, our county government partners. And the, the final thing the bill does is encourages the county to contribute towards this effort on an 80-20 basis, whereas this uh, proposed change would allow uh, Marbitco and Smedic to use these funds on a 60-40 basis rather than a 70-30 basis. So that briefly summarizes my uh, testimony, Mr. Chairman. We're here in support of this. We urge a favorable report. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. McKenna. We have uh, two more witnesses then. We'll take questions. Uh, let's go to Steve Mandel, if you're here with us, Mr. Mandel. I am. Thank you, Chair Pinsky and Vice Chair Kagan and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Stephen Mandel. I am the co-chair of the Critical Issues Forum. We are a group comprised of three synagogues in Montgomery County that has been advocating for about six years for measures that reduce food insecurity in Maryland. And we urge a federal report on SB 121. Food insecurity rates have nearly doubled in Maryland during the pandemic. In 2020, for example, more than one in 10 households in the state suffered food insecurity and SNAP applications in Maryland skyrocketed. Even today, when we're presumably we're, we're getting out of the uh, pandemic situation, food insecurity among our black residents is over 10% and among Latinx is 23%. We must take steps now to assure that we are better able to deal with these hunger issues not just in emergencies, but every day. The production of a sustainable locally grown food system is a key element in providing long-term food security in our communities. We can no longer demand that our residents rely on supply chains that extend for thousands of miles. And we don't need to. Agriculture represents Maryland's largest commercial industry employing more than 350,000 residents. We need to create and support resilient integrated food systems that at any given time could provide locally grown, affordable, healthy food to our residents. I'm not gonna go into the specifics of the three measures, those have been covered already. I'm just gonna close by saying, Senator Faye Hester's bill constitutes a very reasonable, sensible series of proactive steps that will both aid Maryland food consumers and, and Maryland's agriculture. We urge a favorable report on SB 121. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mandel. Um, and
And finally, uh, Amanda Beth Brewster from Caroline uh, County Public Schools. Um, good evening. I am the only person holding you between um, for dinner, so I will be. No, very we, we have another bill, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> okay. This committee does. This committee doesn't eat or sleep. <laughs> okay. Um, so my name is Beth Brewster. I am the um, supervisor of food service for Caroline County Public Schools. I had the privilege of sitting on the food resiliency committee. Um, I learned a lot throughout that process. Um, I specifically want to talk about farm to school, how it would benefit us operationally. Um, it is a, it's a pilot. This is not a mandate um, for the school systems. I really do believe that it will help us to make better partners with our farmers um, to get more farm to school and hopefully farm to institution. Um, so basically, it will help us to cut down on cost on um, staffing, on the purchasing, and it will incentivize other districts to do more farm to school. I, um, I hope you're able to read my testimony to see how much we do for farm to school. Um, we have a very good program in Caroline County um, and this would definitely benefit us. So bottom line is let's keep our farmers farming. Let's feed our kids healthy, nutritious local food. So, um, thank you for hearing me. Um, Senator Hester, thank you for asking me to testify. And I, I hope you find support for this bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize that I missed a chunk of this hearing because I was in budget and taxation on a nonprofit bill, but I have two questions. And if you've already spoken to them, I can just get the answer offline. Uh, question for Senator Hester. If you could, um, I'm looking at page three, lines 25 through 30. If you could, um, if you haven't already explained uh, the shift from 70% to 60% of grant monies um, going directly to the Far, farmer's market, and then the uh, on the next section, going from 30% to 40%. Um, so if you can just uh, address those two funding changes, uh, percentage changes, and then uh, Michael J. Wilson, if you um, could tell us about the impact of the pandemic on SNAP participation, if you've got any numbers, any data on that, I'd love to hear about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the question, Senator Kagan. I think I'm gonna to defer to Steve McHenry on this one. Yes, uh, Senator Kagan, what, uh, what's happening here is current law allows the recipient of the Marbitco, excuse me, the MDA grant to retain 30%, uh, uh, up to 30% for its administrative costs and other expenses, and then 70% would have to go for food incentive funding. And because this money is the, is the first dollar into the program, it's foundational to all the, all the other grant seeking and fundraising that goes on, we think it's, it's more appropriate for this particular source of money to allow up to 40% to be used for uh, administrative costs and, and then 60% would be used for incentives. This encourages particularly local governments to then add additional dollars. And there's additional uncodified language in the, in the legislation, which encourages an 80-20 split by our partnering local government. So for example, Prince George's and Montgomery counties in our contracts with them, uh, they allow us to keep 20% for admin costs and other reporting and other work that we have to do, whereas 80% goes for the food incentives that are used by the, uh, the recipients of those, double, uh, those uh, incentive dollars at the farmer's markets. So that's the reason for the change. And Mr. Wilson, to the second question about the effect on SNAP of the pandemic. Briefly though, we do have one more bill. Yeah, I can do this really quickly. Um, prior to the pandemic in the state of Maryland, 6 million residents, 597,000 people on SNAP, literally one in 10. Highest, as according to the latest data by the Department of Human Services, there are 860,000 people in Maryland using SNAP. So we've seen a great growth. We've seen a huge growth um, but there's been a need for this. And I think one of the challenges is how do we move forward from the challenges that people are having? Um, even though this program helps, particularly the Maryland market money will give people a better opportunity uh, um, to be able to utilize their benefits at local farmers markets. Um, it is such a small amount, the $300,000 that we're asking for is so small. Um, I talked to a grocery store manager in Montgomery County yesterday small grocery store, he says they do $200,000 in revenue a week. We're asking for $300,000 for the state of Maryland, 
for a year. <laughs> it is peanuts uh, in terms of what is needed. And that was an intentional food pun. I was going to say that's that's bad, but that, that fits in the HA. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Okay, uh, seeing no further questions, um, that concludes the hearing on uh, Senator Hester's second bill. We're going to go to the final bill of the day, Senate Bill 229, Senator Gallion, uh, on farm composting facilities permit exemption. Uh, we'll start with Senator Gallion. He'll be followed by Jeremy Chris, um, and then uh, Keith Olinger. Um, and then uh, we'll be followed by uh, Colby Ferguson, um, Benjamin Fisher, Fischler, Emily Ranson, and Ben Perry. And I don't see any opposition signed up. Uh, with that, Senator Gallion, please um, welcome and begin. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Senator Jason Gallion to introduce Senate Bill 229, Environment on Farm Composting Facilities permit exception. This legislation will expand the current 5,000 square foot permit exception up to 40,000 square feet for on-farm composting facilities. Currently, farmers are able to compost up to 40,000 square feet without a permit if materials are generated from the farm. Farmers would still need to comply with the requirement of a soil conservation and water quality plan and nutrient management plan. Our goal with this legislation is to allow food scraps to be covered under these regulations. We're currently working on an amendment with advocates and the cross file sponsor, Delegate Shetty, to clarify contamination levels, record keeping, and how soon scraps must be incorporated into active composting. Allowing on-farm composting to expand is a win-win for the farming and environmental community as it allows farms to increase composted organic matter uh, used and will also help the environment by reducing the amount of waste going into landfills. At this time, I'd like to turn over to my panel who can share a little bit of how we got here and their personal experience with on-farm composting. Thank you, Senator Gallion. Uh, Jeremy Chris is our lead off witness. Mr. Chris, you have up to five minutes, welcome. Oh, you are muted. Nope, you're close. Here we go. Yeah, nice Very to good. see you. Welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Jeremy Chris. I'm the director of the Office of Agriculture in Montgomery County. I want to thank the committee for this opportunity to speak in support of SB 229. I also want to thank Senator Gallion for his leadership in sponsoring this legislation. Uh, the legislation will increase the on-farm composting facility permit exemption, uh, allowable threshold for composting certain feed certain type two feedstocks, including food scraps from all farm from 5,000 square feet to 40,000 square feet. As a member of the 2014 composting facilities working group, I advocated for a permit exemption to help expand opportunities for on-farm composting in Montgomery County and the state. When the composting facilities regulations were adopted in 2015, I accepted the 5,000 square foot area limitation for on-farm composting of type two feedstocks, such as food scraps as the first step for Maryland. Since 2015, Montgomery County Office of Agriculture has been working with farming operations to explore the 5,000 square foot area, including the use of different feedstocks as part of the operation to produce local food. We learned that the 5,000 square foot area is very limiting factor and it creates a disincentive economically for farmers to implement on-farm composting. One of these farms installed a maximum of 5,000 square feet, and they are composting type one and two feedstocks to produce a valuable product and soil amendment that is, a, that is applied to the farmland in accordance with the soil conservation and water quality plan for the farm, as well as the nutrient management plan to increase soil health for local food production. Last year, Montgomery County adopted a zoning text amendment 20-04 to expand opportunities for on-farm composting which allows up to 50% of the materials being composted from off-site, including food scraps. The composting facilities regulations currently allow farmers to compost materials generated from the farm up to a maximum of 40,000 square feet without a permit. The intent of SB 229 is to replicate this existing provision in the composting facilities regulations and apply it to, to type two feedstocks, which includes food scraps, 
with the requirement of a soil conservation and water quality plan, a nutrient management plan, and best management practices such as immediate mixing of carbon materials and record keeping. Thank you again, and I respectfully ask for a favorable report on SB 299. 229. <laughs> 229, correct. Thank you, Mr. Chris. Appreciate it. Keith Olinger, you are, or Olinger, uh, welcome. You are next. You have up to two and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair. You got it right. It's Olinger. Thank you. I guess I'm close to the last person standing. Thank you for hanging in with us here. Uh, it's good to see Senator Katie Fry Hester, my own senator, and uh, Senator Clarence Lamb on here. Good to see you, sir, from Howard County. Um, so I'm just going to I gave you my written testimony. I'm just going to tie up a few loose ends here. Um, if you if you look at, we got a kind of a hierarchy going on in, in food production. We try and get the food to the people that need it most right away. If that recipient doesn't need it, can't use it, we try and rescue it and get it to someone else that that can help us. From that point, if it's not going to where you know it's it's potentially going to go bad, we try and get it to livestock to feed livestock. And then the next step down is what we're talking about is going into a compost pile. We definitely do not want it rotting. We don't want it sent to a landfill. It's, it's a waste of valuable resources that way. So what, what used to happen prior to the, the Industrial Revolution is we had a closed loop. Things would start at the farm. It would go to the consumer. And those cutoffs and whatever else was left would go back to the farm to help support food production and to help re restore the environment. We have a broken system now in that it starts at the farm, it goes to the consumer, and then it goes to the landfill. And we're trying to get some of that back. So in my case, the way the current legislation is set up, and we've dealt with this now for, for, for several years, is that I have an either-or situation. I can either do my 40,000 square feet and work with what I need for my nutrient management plan to deal with our livestock manure, or I can accept food scraps and ratchet down to 5,000 square feet and take food scraps. Well, I can't run my operation on the 5,000 square feet. I have to use the 40,000 square feet because the volumes are that are involved. So what happens is I can't participate in taking those food scraps and making the compost. So the, the, the compost that we make, it's part of our nutrient management plan and managing our, our, our manure, but we use that for our fertility. We spread that, we make the compost, we spread it out on our land, we don't use any herbicides or pesticides. We have dung beetles, we have earthworms. Our soil health is exploding. It's good all the way around. Um, so by, by giving that expansion, we could then accept food scraps. And now we don't lose our ability to manage our, our farm products. So um, I just wanted to, to clarify that a little bit. And I want to piggyback off what some of the previous testimony uh, for Senate Bill 39, we could really use those meat inspections. Yeah. And for Senator Hester's previous Bill 121. Thank, Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mr. Olinger. Appreciate it. Uh, the next witness is Benjamin Fischler with the Maryland Sierra Club. Is Mr. Fischler here? Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm Can here. You agree that it's, if it's possible, we'd love to see your face. If it's not. Oh, um, okay. Then either way, yeah. your time. There you, you go. We got to okay. see that beard. Come on. <laughs> you may begin your testimony. Thank all you. All right. Uh, good afternoon. And, um, I'm Ben Fischler. I'm the composting lead for the Maryland Sierra Club's Zero Waste Team. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of more than 70,000 members and supporters of the Maryland Sierra Club uh, in strong support of SB 229 uh, with amendments that, that have already been discussed. Thank you, Senator Gallian was mentioning that, and, and Jeremy, and thank you for the, I'll try to keep it brief because you've already explained the bill well. Um, we're I would like to point out that the bill benefits Maryland farmers, as Keith was saying so well, and, and as well as Maryland's environment, that expanding the options for on-farm composting will divert food waste from landfills, will thus conserve space in our landfills, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, create uh, green businesses and jobs. So this is an important step on the path to zero waste, is, along with all the agricultural benefits. So. Um, You've, heard, you've heard, heard from the Senator about the current regulations and the discussions that have been going on, and as Jeremy said also with, um, and that's what uh, we, we'd like to point out, the Sierra Club would like to support the objective of the bill, but it's to clarify the, exactly which, what parts of the code will be changed and what other requirements are, uh, the expansion would have to satisfy. Um, 
we'd like this bill to clarify that uh, facilities are constructed and operated with a nutrient management plan, uh, along with uh, either a soil concentrated water quality plan or a agricultural waste management system plan, and that, that they can accept the food scraps that are generated off site farm. With this clarification, uh, SB 229 will produce many environmental and economic benefits related to the diversion of food scraps and the production and use of compost on farms. As clarified, the Maryland chapter of the Sierra Club respectfully requests a favorable report on SB 229. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fischler. Appreciate your testimony. We just have two witnesses, colleagues, and then we're done. But uh, Senator Croza, are you okay if we finish these next two witnesses and then appreciate it? Okay. Emily Ranson, as the chairman said, Clean Water Action. Ms. Ranson, nice to see you again. Welcome to EHA. All right. Thank you for having me. I am Emily Ranson with Clean Water Action. Also here favorable with amendment, but it sounds like the sponsors are working on them and we really appreciate both them and the advocates working on the bill, working with us and other water quality groups to address some of these concerns. Basically, we just want to make sure that there are some reasonable guardrails to make sure that there are plans to immediately incorporate the food scraps and make sure that MDE as administering this program is aware of how all of this fits into the nutrient management and water quality and you know, waste plans and whatnot. We're hugely supportive of how uh, Keith Olinger, how you put it, closing this loop. We totally understand that allowing farmers to accept more food scraps helps them create a better quality compost for both soil health, the environment, water quality, as well as their own viability as uh, local farms. And we support this effort because uh, finding more places to tackle food scraps, to handle food scraps, to uh, incorporate them into good quality compost is a great win for the environment. And we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, thank you, Ms. Scar. And uh, closing us off is going to be Ben Perry with Compost Crew. And Mr. Perry, I should let you know that every week in Annapolis, I bring home my own banana skins and apple cores to add to my own compost in my backyard. So Tell us about Compost Crew and what you think about uh, about Senate Bill 229. Well, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Madam Vice Chair. I really appreciate that. Thanks, Senator Galleon and, and committee members. Um, my name is Ben Perry. I'm CEO of Compost Crew. We're a food scrap recycling and composting business that's based in Rockville, Maryland. We help thousands of businesses, municipalities, and, and homes recycle their food waste. And we mix those food scraps that we collect with um, on farms with with yard waste to make compost, which enriches soil, supports local food production and, and benefits the environment. We like to partner with local farms to recycle food scraps and make compost for, for a number of reasons. One, it's an additional income stream for farms. We can make an organic soil amendment on the farm that can be used on site to replace some of the chemical inputs. And it creates a circular economy for a community that allows a town or municipality to grow food and recycle food scraps in a closed loop. The existing permit exemption thre threshold of 5,000 square feet is extremely limiting. And just for perspective, one acre is approximately 43,000 square feet. So the existing permit exemption for the total footprint of an on-farm facility that incorporates food scraps is about one-tenth of one acre. That's really small. So our goal is to build organics recycling infrastructure to support Maryland's recycling and environmental objectives while benefiting farms. And to be run properly on farm composting systems require investments in site improvements, equipment, and trained staff. And most farms are operating already on razor thin mar margins and recycling companies like ours are competing with conventional trash um, companies. So we need to work very hard to build professionally managed, economically viable on-farm systems. So what this bill will do, it, it will relax an economic disincentive to building on-farm composting systems while maintaining provisions that require best management practices for the composting process and on-farm application of the finished soil amendment. So you know, we, we hope for a, a favorable report from the committee with the amendments that Senator Galleon discussed. And thanks so much for your time. Have a good evening. 
Thank you, Mr. Perry. Thank you for your work. And uh, once again, guys, I overlooked and I overlooked someone wonderful. So Colby Ferguson, you are signed up uh, to testify. Marilyn Farm Bureau, why don't you wrap us up and then we'll take questions from Senator Croza and anyone else. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau. And this is my fourth time up, so I, I'm, I'm sure you thought I was already done. So um, yes, we come in support of, of uh, Senate Bill 229, uh, and you've already heard all the reasons why this is a great bill. Um, I would just add that right now we're stuck at 5,000 square feet, which is, if you do the math, is a 50 feet by 100 foot uh, pad, which is basically a starter pad for most, uh, most uh, small farms. Uh, and we're just at looking to get this thing to a point where we can take our on-farm uh, products that we're already using and, and, and start to incorporate. When you start to bring in a truckload from, uh, from a school system, uh, that would pretty much take up that 5,000 square feet. So we need the ability to incorporate the, the food waste in there. And we think this is a good, good opportunity and we're not looking to circumvent any water quality improvement pieces. So uh, we do think this is a good bill and uh, thanks for bringing it forward. And we support Senate Bill 229. Thank you, Colby, for your brevity. Senator Croza, you have a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Actually, your comments earlier, uh, one of our earlier hearings has prompted this question. I first want to thank Senator Gallian for introducing the on-farm composting facilities bill. But what prompted me uh, to bring a couple different groups together, I had mentioned before in an earlier hearing that I have a local restaurant group that Go Green that is um, working on their uh, composting uh, with all the food leftovers from the restaurants in Ocean City. And then I was looking at this group, um, you know, having our restaurant owners, Senator Galley, and possibly work with our, our farmers, maybe to see if there's some partnerships where some of these restaurant owners could take advantage of these um, on-farm composting facilities. So I, I wanted to just uh, with you, Senator Galleon, as the bill sponsor, but and to raise uh, you know the question with the other uh, stakeholders who have testified in support to maybe see if there's a way that um, you know we can um, draw more into um, this very positive bill and this positive um, expansion of composting. Yeah, and, you know, any I I mentioned it, uh, not today, but um, I. Uh, uh, have a, a deal worked out with the Wegmans where I get all their uh, food that um, I can feed to the cattle twice a week. Nice. So I kind of have that thought where whatever we can keep out of the landfill and put to use, uh, you know, I'm all for it. And, uh, you know, with a little less regulation, hopefully help some of these farmers out. Uh, so any, you know, any reach out, anything we can do to expand this, you know, I, I think it's a win-win. I didn't know if, if Jeremy had anything to add on that. He was so Senator Gallian, just reminder, there was no opposition testimony. So if it's okay, if there's if we can just take a couple of quick questions and wrap up that's, for the day. That's fine with me, Madam okay. Vice Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Hester had a question and hopefully that'll help us be done. Senator Hester. Thank you very much. And um, I just wanted to say hi to Mr. Olinger and um I did have a question, which maybe we can talk about offline, but I seem to recall having this conversation at the local level in 2020, 2016, 2017. And I'm curious if this statewide bill addresses some of those previous concerns. It doesn't. Okay, then if, if um, Okay, so we've already talked about uh, possible amendments. So Senator Hester, maybe you can chat with uh, the experts here and with Senator Gallian and uh, share that with our legal counsel and uh, make sure that we have that information in a timely way before we vote. Is that okay? All right, with that then, I see no other questions. Colleagues, thank you for hanging in. It's been uh, a good productive four hours and thank you very much. Uh, that com completes the hearing on Senate Bill 229, Senator Gallian, and that completes our hearings for the day. Stay safe everybody, see you tomorrow.